<laughs> How good is Crystal's arm? That's the real question. <laughs> it's not sharp, it's dull. So it's one o'clock, so we're going to adjourn. Or adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Call, to Call to order the student fees meeting. Um, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have the Ulrich Art Museum. Oh, first, does anyone have any opening statements or anything that they wanted to talk about from yesterday's meeting? No? Oh. Yes, uh, Representative Stephanopoulos. Hello, I'm Ephthemio Stephanopoulos. I represent graduate students. My major is uh, Master's of Business Administration. This is more general. Uh, when do we expect to receive all the requested um, items that we were asking for yesterday? So when I spoke to everyone, I asked them to send it to us by Wednesday so that when we go into deliberations on Thursday and Friday, they'll have it with them. Um, so that's the goal. I know that some of the things that we requested are a bit complicated, so I wanted to give them some time to get it together. Um, so I'm gonna email them today, again, reminding them so that they have it in by Wednesday. Uh, any other questions or opening statements? No? Okay. Awesome, so we have the Ulrich Art Museum here today with a new request for student fees funding. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to the Ulrich to describe their request and um, introduce yourselves as well so everyone knows your names. And then we'll, oh, I guess you can see our names. We'll, we'll just, we'll just introduce pass introductions. In yeah, introduce yourself as you begin speaking, okay? All right, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Leslie Brothers. I'm the director of the Ulrich Museum of Art. And our proposal is um, part of a two-part plan, which is to transform our conference room into a collection study center and to transform our lobby space into a student lounge. And the request is for funding to purchase furnishings for these two spaces that we see as connected. Should we, should we have yeah. everyone introduce themselves? Yeah, okay. introduce I'm Jana Irwin, the head of education at the Ulrich. Um, I'm Nellie Elliott and I'm a curatorial intern at the Ulrich. I'm Carter Bryant. I'm an education and curatorial intern at the Ridge. I'm Darren Dufresne. I'm the director of the writing program. Shall I begin? Yes. Okay. I think I'm ready. Is it on? You can put it on. Okay. Point it that way. Point it that way. You have the magic. That's good. That's excellent. Oh. Oh, she is? Oh, okay, great. Great. So uh, I put this up just in case you didn't know that the Elrich Museum of Art is your university art museum. How many, how many of you have been to, to the museum? And please, please don't worry about if you haven't. Wow, that's great. And have you been to the museum as a student, as part of a class, or yes? Um, have you just gone on your own to see exhibitions? And I'm wondering if any of you 
have been to the museum as part of a tour that you took in high school or junior high school by any chance? Okay, great, great. So the Elrich Museum of Art was the big plan of President Alberg back at the end of the 60s, and he thought that uh, excellent university needed to have an excellent art museum. And so he established, together with Martin Bush, uh, the Outdoor Sculptures Collection, the beginning of the Outdoor Sculpture Collection, and then once the building uh, existed, once the building was completed, the indoor art collection. And so there were a couple of endowments set up at the time, exclusively for the purchase of works of art, as well as the care and maintenance of works of art. Um, I'm sorry, we could, we could sw switch. There, there we are. <laughs> and those endowments have grown over time and they've ensured that this museum has the highest quality collection of modern and contemporary art. And, and, and that is ongoing. And at this point, I'd like to make a note that SGA has contributed significantly to a legacy benchmark connected to the outdoor sculpture collection. So between the years of 1972 and 2008, SGA helped to fund and commission 22 outdoor sculptures. And when you walk around campus, it's very clearly noted on the signage. And I've been here for 17 months, and I, I found that experience of getting to know the, the campus and reading those signs to be most remarkable and, and impressive. And I, I believe that when the museum has the opportunity to work with student government in, in this capacity, um, we, we should. So um, let's go to the next one. Thank you. I'm sorry. It's just... Uh, so I want to take you into the museum to show you the spaces. So this is the entryway. This is a lobby space, it's a gallery space, um, and if we go to the next one, it's a space that has absolutely no seating. So <laughs> this is not a setup, actually. A couple days ago, three students walked in, and they were waiting for the rest of their class, and they looked around and did uh, the best thing they could do, which was sit down on the floor. <laughs> so we're not proud of this. <laughs> this is something we're, we're committed to, uh, to changing. So if we can move forward. So they were on their way into what is currently our <coughs> conference room. And uh, this is the space that we're proposing to enlarge and to, um, to transform. And I will... Um, pass the next section on to the head of education, Jana Irwin, to, if, if you could go to the next one, to talk about how we are improving student experience at the Ulrich Museum of Art. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, I want to I wanna talk about the academic programming that we do at the museum, specifically for the students of this university and creating opportunities for them to engage with works of art from the collection um, uh, and, and to build their visual uh, thinking skills um, and, and to use that across all disciplines on campus. Um, and we have for many years uh, provided opportunities for faculty and instructors in all departments on campus to request specific works be pulled from the vault 
uh, for them to discuss with their students um, that, are, that are relevant to the curriculum they're currently studying. Um, for those of you who have been in the museum, you know that we are a small facility. And most of our square footage is utilized for exhibitions. And so um, we have pulled work out of, uh, out of the vault, placed it on A-frames that we use to transport work, placed it on carts, and, and placed it in the center of a gallery. Um, the other half of that experience um, is uh, working with every English 101 student and class. And it's about 35 sections um, uh, that come to the museum. And we use about four, because that's all we have the space for. As you, if, you, if you look, if we, if we go back a little bit, let me, you know, it's okay. Let's go back just, okay. So <laughs> I just have to show you this because it was just so difficult. Um, again, we have very limited space at the museum. And so those large black file cabinets that you see in the conference room are our object files. So they contain files on every object that we have in our collection. We had nowhere to put them. And so they, the decision was made to move them into the conference room, and we would make do. So I want you to envision that space and picture 25 folding chairs lined up for these sections of English students to work with these, um, these photographs. It was extremely difficult. This past fall, we managed to find a space, and we moved those file cabinets out which opened up the ability for us to initiate using visual thinking strategies with these English students. And that was critical to, to broadening and deepening their experience in, in utilizing these visual prompts for their writing assignments. Should we move on? Yes, move on. Okay, all right, so, oops, go back. So that's an example of what... So we... So our really only option for displaying these photographs and keeping them safe right, um, is to place them within these glass-fronted display cabinets uh, that were meant for something completely other. And it is not ideal uh, for uh, close-looking and uh, uh, intimate discussions and in-depth discussions with these groups of students. Um, the picture on the right is this morning at 8 a.m., and we had 25 um, uh, English students um, piling into the room. I just thought I'd show you that. Um, but just so you have a little bit of an understanding of, of, of visual thinking strategies and why we think it's so important to be able to provide this experience for the students here with the, with the collection, I just want to read a, a little bit to give you an idea. Of, of what it is and how it functions. Um, Data-driven research on, on BTS or visual thinking strategies um, really confirms ideas as old as um, Aristotle, that when our brains are negotiating aesthetic territory, virtually all aspects of cognition come into play. And this happens because of the very nature of art. Much of what we see in art is common to all of our daily experience, um, depicting people, places, things, expressions, interactions, moods, weather, spaces, light, and color. And virtually all of that we experience or imagine finds its way into art of various times and cultures. Um, but works of art are also ambiguous in meaning, and they're multi-layered, intentionally open to interpretation, and often have symbolic and abstract elements. And uh, making sense of them through VTS discussions offer um, great training for our minds by asking us to look carefully at complex, intriguing works of art, to engage in thoughtful, extended examinations of what they find, 
and to back up their ideas with visual evidence and to listen to and consider the views of others agreeing, disagreeing, or building on what they hear. This exercise in visual thinking is a rich form of cognition, incorporating processes applicable in most disciplines, and has been proven to increase critical thinking skills, verbal agility, and empathy among those students that participate in these types of discussions with works of art. And so um, the creation of you know, this transformation of this space into a collection study center would allow us, if we could go on, would allow us um, uh, to be able to both display uh, works of art in the appropriate manner to elicit these kinds of complex discussions. Um, yeah, and be able to, uh, for us to really provide the best experience possible for the students. Um, there are a couple of examples. We have slides of a couple of examples. One at the Spencer Museum at KU, and the other at the Beach Museum. We are currently the only um, uh, university in the KBOR system that does, a uh, university art museum in the KBOR system that has not put in a study center yet. And so it's really imperative that we do. And I asked Dr. Dufresne to come because he has been um, a staunch supporter of the work we're doing um, with, with the English students at the museum and the impact it has on him. And I was hoping he might share his thoughts. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I came here 15 years ago, and um, uh, but I've been teaching composition since 1989. And one of the things that I hear thrown around a lot is critical thinking skills and how important those are in writing and um, with our freshmen particularly. And so I'm, I'm always looking for ways to reinforce critical thinking. And one of those ways that um, uh, we do that is we focus on analysis in our English 101 class. And a lot of you guys have had English 101 here. You probably attended the uh, Gordon Parks photo analysis that we do, that, that unit in English 101. Um, it's been a really good successful tool for us. Um, and it's not just with the analytical unit, but um, it does a lot of things. It gets students out of the classroom for a day for one. I know I went to the University of Utah, and for four years I walked by our art museum on campus. It's a splendid art museum. And my thought was, I'm not supposed to go in there. <laughs> I don't know why I th had that thought, but um, I've since found out that most of our students have that same thought when they walk by buildings. If their classroom is not in there, they don't understand that that's a really good resource for them and something that they, they have ownership in. Um, we have our students come into this little tiny room and they look at photos from the Gordon Parks collection. And Parks is one of the true geniuses to come out of Kansas. And I don't throw that word around lightly. He's, he absolutely... Uh, was a genius and his photos um, are so lasting and, and they're great for this unit. We, Jana curates them, she'll, she'll give us several different ones to, to take a look at every semester and they rotate so that the photos don't degrade too much from use. Put the photos out there and the students take a look at them and, and we start to break down what they mean. And a lot of Parks' work um, had to do with the civil rights era and some things going on there. And what has been so striking is how those photos hold up, and I'll give you a quick example. Um, one of the first times I took students over there, uh, I had some assumptions about what students know about the civil rights era, and I was way off base. Um, we had four photos up there, and there was one of them of a young Muhammad Ali, looked like he had been in a fight, um, it was like post-fight, or maybe it was during the fight, just a close-up of his face and the light was shining on him. He was, he was sweating from the fight and just, he looked very regal in that, that photo. And so I asked the students to start to just think about the photo and think, what do you, what do you know of this photo? I didn't tell them who it was. I assumed they knew who it was. And it was crickets. Nobody was saying anything in the, in the class. Not unusual for that class. Um, so I, I, Gave them a little longer to think about it. And I said, just whatever comes to mind, go ahead, throw, throw something out here. And after like a painfully long time, a woman in the back of the room who uh, was kind of a character, uh, she broke the ice and she said, I'd like to lick the sweat off of that. 
And uh, it struck me when she said that, it struck me in a lot of different ways, but she had no idea who that was or that that photo was about 50 years old. Um, she didn't know who Muhammad Ali was. And so this was a great teaching opportunity to talk about his importance to the broader culture and who, who you know, who he was, what he meant. And we, we had such a great discussion that followed from that really weird comment that she made in class. But um, that, that room is, I, I will back Jen up, it's very cramped. You get 25 students in there and they have to go up and rotate. And again, some of you are nodding. You probably went through this where you had to march by, take a look at the photos and then come back and sit down and then have, have a discussion that way. Something like this Beach Museum of Art study room would make that a much easier uh, process and, and would have a lot of applications beyond just our composition class. But we have, we have a couple thousand students go through this every year and it's been a really good learning opportunity for our students. Thank you so much. We're going to go into a questioning period so that they get some, some time to ask questions oh. um, about your request. But thank you for all the work that you do with um, incoming students and also at the Museum of Art. Um, yes. C could we scroll forward just to... Yes, yes. We, we had... You can, you can just keep going. Um, to get to the plans for the new spaces. Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. We, there we go. And, oh, okay. and maybe uh, another one. <laughs> one more. One more. Okay. That's that's cool. That, that gives you some sense. Or maybe one more. Sorry. <laughs> no, one. maybe one more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, so this is that's the good. Whitney, and this gives you an example of, of how those works could be displayed um, on these wall size uh, easels. This is good. Okay. Great. Thanks. This will this will. Just so you can see um, what the plan is for the future and uh, how important the student lounge is to creating an atmosphere where students feel like they belong and that having access to the collection is something that is part of your student experience here at Wichita State. Okay. Great. Sorry. Perfect. No, no, no. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, Representative Kirk. Hi. My name is John. I am a fine arts senator here at WSU. And um, I, I noticed that here on 6, it says, um, where you're getting your uh, your sources, it, you say other sources of revenue will be um, individual private donors. How many, like roughly, would you say you have of that? So this is uh, the collection study space, just as the student lounge space is a naming opportunity, and so we would love to have SGA as part of that. Um, and we have five possible donors who have had long-term relationships with the Ulrich, who we know would be very interested in legacy, in naming something that has uh, an educational commitment and would increase the quality of student experience going forward. So. I can't tell you who they are, but we, we do have we do have five in mind. And has um, I know that you're looking at roughly a hundred thousand dollars from or ask from SGA and then a hundred thousand dollars in fundraising. Um, how much of that hundred hundred thousand dollars in fundraising has al already been fundraised? Do you know? <laughs> We have about 10000 10, already 000. in a fund. Okay. okay. Yes. And uh, do you know what the long-term outlook for when you'll reach that $100,000 mark will be? Or do, do you guys have a rough estimate? So the plan is to begin demo uh -huh. and to begin the demolition and the renovation the summer of 2021. 2021. So... We're motivated by that okay, yeah. <laughs> plan to, get it to have that money in place. If um, the money hasn't been fundraised, will you push the project back a year, or do you know? Do you have an idea of what you will do then? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, we're committed to it happening. Yeah. If yes, if it if it isn't the summer of 2021, which we're Hoping. we're thinking yeah. it will be. <laughs> um, yes. Okay. Of Stephanopoulos. <laughs> um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I had a question about the plans. Um, How did you guys get the plans drawn up? Was it by the university? And then who's the builder that suggested that you guys are looking at using? So we're working with Emily Patterson's office and with David Strouth, her, her, the, her ar the architect who is assisting her. So these are David's renderings that he put together specifically for <laughs> our presentation today. And so we're, we're thankful to that. But we've been working with them um, for the past six months, like since we decided that we really we really could do this, and we were really committed to doing this. Yeah. So we'd be a campus-based so project. So that means that you're hiring builders that campus already has to build the project. Too? We'll be working through their office. So the whoever they use will be using. So a Is, point, does that, point of clarification. Sorry. Every yeah, no, you're good. Every um, building project that goes on on campus has to go through the university. So they will choose who uh, who the builder ultimately is. Uh, Representative Kirk. Yes, I know that you say, um, it says in here that uh, English 101, uh, art his, um, history, um, and another uh, class uses the, um, the facility here in the Oil Ridge, but do you offer um, it to be used by uh, an art group or even any group here on campus that needs that is trying to do X, Y, and Z of some type of study? Absolutely. Janet, do you want to give an example of that and that uh, we've done already? Um, well, in the past, yes. So printmaking or, uh, yeah. Any, any class on campus. What we're moving towards and what, what, what will make this uh, study center um, uh, uh, really a, a central point at the, uni at the museum is that we are uh, launching our online collection portal. Actually, and it's available actually, yeah. now. We you can it. go on our website and search our entire collection. We did it very quietly on Friday. <laughs> there are still a few, um, you know, a few glitches here and there, but we're, you know, working them out. Um, but yes, you can go to our website and you can access that collection portal. And, and so uh, with that collection portal available to the entire campus, to, you know, essentially the entire world, um, that collection study center will be imperative for having individual students, not just classrooms, not just classes, be able to request to see individual works from the collection, you know, by accessing it through that portal, and we'll be able to fulfill those requests. Yeah, one of the super cool things about the collection being online is that anyone, any student here on campus, any faculty member, staff member, will be able to peruse the collection, select something that they want to see, and submit a request. And we'll place it on view for you for a certain period of time. And, and, and we're following, this is Harvard's model. You know, they connected their three museums and created a space for teaching and learning that's just out of this world. But a part of it was that it was set up so that you could request to have works from the collection placed on view for your own interests, your own use. And we plan to follow that. Um, so recognizing that this is a priority for the Ulrich, um, what was your initial plan for funding? And what was the outlook for how long it would take you if you were going to fundraise the full 
$200,000 or so? It would be pretty much the same. We'd, we'd just be, you know, calling in. We'd more asks. Um, we looked at. I mean, we looked into grant writing for sure, and um, the NEA, the IMLS, actually has funding opportunities for after the fact. So they do not cover any kind of capital, um, but they will cover staff, furthering you know what we do in the space. So um, uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to find. Um, funding for the capital and the equipment but uh, yeah we were just you know we're going to make our our list longer you know just to say um, the Ulrich Museum of Art uh, receives funding from the state to cover most of the salaries and fringes of eight full-time people and one three-quarter time person and it, right now about 10 part-time students uh, we supplement one of those salaries through an endowment fund um, held by the foundation. What you're looking at on our budget sheet, that's the, that's the fund within the state org that we, that we supply with fundraising. So the Ulrich has about 20,000 in operating support after salaries and fringes from the state. The rest so to finance about $150,000 a year in exhibitions and programming costs, we fundraise for. So, you know, we're, we're here because I, I think I noted in the application that it's additional fundraising for us. Um, it's not like we're not out there with our hands out. <laughs> so we, we saw this as an opportunity that made a lot of sense um, to come to you guys for assistance. All right. Thank you so much. I think that's all that we have time for today if we're going to keep on schedule. But thank you for coming in, and we look forward to getting back with you as soon as we can. Thank you for inviting us to present, of course. having us here today. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for coming in, Camille. If you want to introduce yourself, and then we'll jump, just jump right in so that we can get going. Okay. Hi, my name is Camille Childers. I am the Director of Student Health Services at WSU. Okay. And could you describe a little bit about your request and uh, just briefly describe what Student Health does and then whatever you have ready to present I'd love for to. Us. I love talking about Student Health, so that's pretty easy for me. Um, basically, Student Health Services is the... Our primary role is to provide what we call the college health program at WSU. Um, college health in itself is a specialty in healthcare, and our staff provides healthcare services 
uh, to all currently enrolled students are eligible for to be seen at Student House. So we only see students. That's all the only reason we're there. Uh, we facilitate access to needed services uh, to, that support both individual health goals of students, but we also work with um, looking at the overall campus health. We're kind of functioning as a little mini health department for the campus, as well as provide what we call primary care services, which would include things like illness visits, um, injury, let's say a student has a physical they need for their program or well person exam. We provide vaccinations. We have an on-site lab, which um, we can draw blood for any reason or do other specimens. Some of the tests we can actually run in-house, which is very convenient for the students so they can um, get our lab result right away. Um, most of our other labs that we send out usually within about 24 to 48 hours, we get a response. We also have a, we call it a pharmacy, but it's licensed as an institutional drug room. What that means is that we can fill prescriptions that we write in-house off of our formulary or list of medications. Anything that we don't carry, because we're licensed professionals, we can call out to a local pharmacy of a student's choice. We help to facilitate healthcare for students. Sometimes students need services that we don't provide and like your primary care doctor in your local community, we can make sure they get connected to uh, specialists, whether it's a physical therapy or whether they need to see a special type of doctor or they need a referral, they need an x-ray that we can't do on campus. We go ahead and we help facilitate that. So a little bit of case management involved with that as well. And basically we're committed to supporting students across the spectrum of their academic career. We work with all, all students that are being admitted. We talk at every orientation that the students and parents come to. We also help them stay healthy while they're here and then facilitate their growth and their health literacy as they become um, adults in the working world. Does anyone else have questions for Student Health? Yes. Uh, Representative James. Hello, I'm Zachary James, out-of-state representative. So with the YMCA opening up, they also will be opening up uh, Wesley Urgent Care right next to it. Do you all have any plans or see any problems with uh, decrease in traffic with that opening up real soon? That's a really good question. Um, I have met with some individuals from Wesley as actually this has been in the plan with the YMCA and the Student Wellness Center from probably the very we started planning the building. So I've met with them. My last update I had is they'll be opening later sometime this spring. We've already had some kind of you know conversations about wanting to have um, an agreement on the use of the x-ray because there is an x-ray in the urgent care center. Um, we don't have one in student health and we didn't build one on purpose because we knew that the urgent care center would be there and they would have one. So we've already had some of those discussions. As far as your question related to impact on students, I think it's going to be important that students understand that the urgent care is not student health. Um, the urgent care is open to the community so that they won't be serving just students like we are. They won't be college health specialists. They won't be integrated into the campus. Many of our staff serve on campus level committees. Um, we partner with campus organizations and uh, departments to facilitate free services, such as just this week we had the P for Pizza event, and that's a partnership with ODI. Um, you might have seen the Sunflower article about the partnership we have with Positive Directions for free HIV, syphilis, and hep C testing. All of those kind of things help us become a part of WSU. Wesley is going to be a separate entity. They are a part of Wesley Healthcare. Not that they won't provide good health care, and where our hope is that they will be able to have hours that maybe come after ours or on the weekends, but I don't have that information yet. So I think it's an adjunct to what we do. Um, they will hopefully be here when we're not here, and um, they will also be serving the community. So it's possible that they may do some things that we don't, and we can refer to them and back and forth. So that's my goal, is to be able to work with them. Representative Stephanopoulos. Hello, um, Ophelia Stephanopoulos, graduate student representative. Um, I had a couple questions about your budget. So if we look under on um, page 96, under operating expenditures, um, you had a decrease. Oh, I'll wait for a second. Yeah. 
Um, you had a decrease of contractual services by about $20,000. Then you had a slight increase in the uh, commodities. And then you had about $5,000 increase uh, in the capital outlay. Can you explain what each of those is going towards and why the increase and decreases occurred? For many years, more than I can, more than I, that I've been here, and I've been here eight years, probably about 20 or more years, Student Health Services has been giving CAPS, what used to be counseling and testing, money every year. Uh, initially, it was about $40,000, and since I've been here, we've been trying to decrease that amount, and the last year it was about $24,000 was the amount we gave them this year. And talking with Dr. Provines, who runs the counseling and testing, or counseling and prevention services department, we came to an agreement that we would um, stop doing that. So that amount of money was removed from my account, so that they adjusted my fee requests for the last couple of years to reflect that um, I'm no longer giving money to them out of my budget. So that's one of the changes. But uh, that's a pretty significant change. That's probably why it went down in the commodities area you were looking at. The other areas were adjusted based on needs we have for the department. For example, one of the things that we do, uh, we run an EMR which is an electronic medical record. That's our documentation system for all the clinical care that the students receive. That's run on uh, laptops. We purchased laptops when we started the EMR in about 2014, 2015. We have a systematic schedule to replace them. Um, we try to replace about four or five of them every year. We just started that this year. So when we took away the money for counseling, we added a little more money, more money in to support that because five laptops cost us about $5,000. And we are running probably about 12 to 15 of them, depending on how many staff we have. And we've made them last many years, but the reality is the lifespan of a laptop that has a heavy daily use is about two to three years if you're lucky. So that's what part of that is. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Day. Um, hello, I'm Grant Day. Um, I'm the LAS representative on this committee. Um, I actually have a couple of questions. I'll just focus on one for now. Um, in terms of employee health insurance, um, uh, appears much the overall increase in the budget request is attributable to an increase in the amount allocated towards employee health insurance, but there isn't an increase in the in the full time employees. Could could you explain that? Why the employee health insurance increased? Uh, yeah, it's increased by over by like over ten thousand dollars. Correct. Yeah. When you look at our budget, the amount of money that I have asked for, um, we increased our funding request by ten thousand dollars. When you look at our budget, the only increase there was no increase in salaries from last year. The only change is employee health insurance and benefits. That's a figure that comes from our HR department. I have no control over that. So um, I'm going to give it over to Lauren. Yeah, so yeah. the employee health benefit increases or decreases are really based on, one, the rate that the state gives us, and two, the um, decisions that individual employees are making. And we really can't, like, base decisions on those sorts of things. Okay, that's fine. And they don't have any control over that. It's all outside. Yeah, it all goes through the budget office, basically. Yeah. Representative uh, Hull. Hi, I'm Maggie. I'm the Applied Studies representative. Um, I was just wondering if your reserves that you have um, just listed at the bottom, I know it's a snapshot in time, um, but do you think that is more from you collecting um, like your fees for when people come in to use your um, like facilities, or do you feel like it's more student fees money that's left over? It's actually a little bit of both. Um, I have a running tab of where I started in when I came here in 2012 to where I am today on um, our reserve fund in, and it has grown over the years for several reasons. When I first came we needed to replace a nurse practitioner position and at the time um, it was very difficult for the salary that we had to get a full-time nurse practitioner position filled. In fact I had seven failed searches based 100% on the salary. So I came back to SGA and asked for an additional funds for to increase the base salary and also provide salary equity for the staff because the current staff were also making a less than equitable raise from the person I would be hiring. So SGA very generously allowed me to do that. 
So over the years, we've had staff changeover, and some of the funding that's left that is there is from failed searches. Some of the funding is money that we've earned or left over from our charges for treatment. You'll notice that 100% of the money that is provided to us from SGA goes to salaries and fringe benefits. All operating costs of the department and whatever is left over to make up for salaries and fringes, we, we fund ourselves through charges for treatment. So none of the operating costs of the department are returned back on the students. Yes. Does that answer your question? I, I also just would like to add, we, we purposely wanted Camille's reserve budget to be higher because we weren't sure going into the new building if there were other things that were going to be needed to be purchased that were beyond the, the FF&E that came with the project. And so that's why, in some ways, the, the, there's a stockpiling a little bit of money to, to make sure that if she needed to buy an examination table, she could do that. I will say that we've been in the building about six weeks. And I can, <laughs> I won't have that money left, that money left at the end of the fiscal year because we are. Um, there are things we've discovered that um, were not included or that we had to pay for. Um, for example, when we funded the building um, initially, there was things that we ended up needing after the budget was set that we contributed money from our department to help pay for. So you may not reflect it right now. But uh, we are definitely purchasing things that go along with moving into a, a new space. So. Um, do you anticipate that your outside revenue will increase as um, the students become more aware of student health and they learn about the new building and the new facilities? In an ideal world, yes. So I have a little data on that. Um, as I mentioned in the <laughs> report that I, in my funding request, two variables have happened in the past six months. In um, July of 2019, we changed our pricing structure um, uh, for all of our fees. We have a new financial policy for student health. So we went from a basic $10 visit pretty much across the board to a $30 to $35 visit, depending on whether you're new or returning student. And then we have also um, kind of adjusted some of our other prices for office visits. We also negotiated a new contract for the lab, and we had a very good deal with our new lab provider, and we were able to decrease some of the cost of our lab work. So it may be a wash for some students, depending on why they're coming. The other thing that we have did, and a long-term goal that I've had, was to start doing third-party billing, which means that if you have an insurance plan, when you come to see us, we can use your insurance plan to help pay for some of your services. We are, um, as of October 1st, we're in network with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Kansas. So we have already noticed that the amount of charges for treatment that we're getting just from October to December, the percentage of that that is coming from insurance rather from the student has gone up about 10 to 12 percent. So when your question is whether or not we hope that we'll have additional revenue, yes, we do. Um, but I also want to make sure that that revenue is coming from an appropriate source so we're not planning on raising our fees again this year we're going to keep the same pricing structure we have but we are going to expand into other insurance plans we're hoping to have united healthcare aetna and cigna on board as contractor providers by fall that way students with those plans can also come to student health and use their insurance to help offset some of their costs now, you can't guarantee that your plan and your plan and your plan will pay the same thing because every plan is different. However, it, um, what you pay out of pocket for us will still be less because our initial price is less. For just a simple example, when I go to the doctor, it's like a $120 office visit just to go see them. My insurance doesn't pay all of that. You go to the doctor, your insurance may pay $120 at that, at that um, doctor's office, but you come and see us and your visit is $40. So you're going to get a bigger bang for your buck whether you have insurance or not when you come to student health. So I'm hoping that students will come and see us. I don't have enough data from the first six weeks to say yes. Next year I'll have more information on that. We Any, have, more, Any more questions? Representative Stephanopoulos. Um, on page 95, on the third paragraph from section 8, I can just read it to you if it's simpler. 
it says that uh, $57,000 was given to the YMCA Steve Clark Center and then also to Student Affairs. Can you give me a rough idea of the proportions that were given to each? Definitely. We paid um, $42,000 to YMCA to help offset. I remember I mentioned there was some costs in the budget that were not that we didn't know about at the time. So um, both counseling and um, student health contributed money for that particular item that wasn't covered in the budget. Okay, awesome. Does anyone else have any more questions? Uh, Representative Moika. So based on your previous um, statement on insurance, for students who are not from Kansas but do have the Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, does the student services take the, the our state insurance or do they have to pay out of pocket? We do. Well, what we do is we will bill it as an out-of-network coverage. Um, and then it really depends on the student's plan as to what they cover. Um, we have found that some insurance plans will cover some out-of-network services, some do not. Um, every plan is different. For example, Blue Cross Blue Shield write, writes hundreds of different kinds of plans. And I could have Blue Cross Blue Shield and Nancy could too. We could have two totally different plans, even in the state of Kansas. So it really depends on the in individual's policy as to what it covers. Some will cover out-of-network, some will not. We do bill both. Um, it just, you know, we never turn a student away for inability to pay. You're not required to have insurance to come to student health. One of the reasons that I intentionally kept our price point low was to make sure that students who don't have insurance can still come and get affordable health care. Um, we do have what is also a financial hardship policy. If a student, whether they have insurance or not, runs into a situation where even our charges are too much, we can look at that and discount services as needed. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. All right, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for coming in, Camille, and uh, thank you for all the hard work that you do. All right, so Angie's going to present two budgets today, and we're just going to give her the full 30 minutes for this one. So I'm going to give her 15 minutes to talk about um, her request, and then we'll jump into questions after that. Does that sound good? Yeah? OK. Um, so I'm going to let Angie introduce herself, and then just you can begin to present whatever you prepared today. Okay, my name is Angie Zerlin, and I'm the Assistant Director for Scholarships out of the Office of Financial Aid here on campus. The two funds that I am here to support are both uh, equal opportunity funds. One is for our non-traditional students, which is typically our returning adults or any student that comes in that's over the age of 24. The other uh, fund that I'm looking at is the fund set up for underrepresented populations. So those are the two I'm going to look at. And I'm going to start with the non-traditional student fund. This fund um, has basically been around for quite a while. It is a fund that we have limited dollars. And we work directly with the Office of Returning Adult Students to try to find students for this. The way that it's written in the guidelines, the maximum amount that we can award for a student is $1,000 for the academic year. It's $500 a semester. If they are part-time, then they can receive half of that amount. 
So a lot of our returning adult students are part-time, so it allows us to stretch it out to involve more students than just the amount that we have. Um, currently, we've been funding that at 25000 each year. So it gives us usually around 35 students approximately each year that we look at. Um, we try to find this to work with the students that are a mix of a little bit of everything. We have students that have high performing GPAs, but we also have students that maybe don't have the strongest GPAs. As a returning adult myself, I know what it's like to try to come back and repair damage. <laughs> So this is a fund that helps us to be able to give them a stepping stone. The other thing that we use this fund for quite often is it allows us to get these students kind of on our radar for when other funds that come across in our general funding or our endowed accounts pop up that look for returning adult students. We already have this list of students that we've been able to watch them grow and it gives us a place to start so that we can award them more. It's kind of a launching point. Um, so that's what we really look at for this. We're not asking for an increase in this fund this year. We're wanting to maybe use this year to check a few different things. Maybe the next time we look at increased funding, we may be asking for change in the amount of the maximum from a thousand to maybe higher. So this year is when we kind of want to monitor that. So we felt that if we could stick with the current 25,000 allocation, that's going to give us a good pool of students that's small enough to be able to track and small enough to be able to work with. So with the information that's provided in here, it kind of gives a history. Uh, is there anyone on the committee that has any questions about this specific fund or need any further details? Yeah, we can, op we'll open it up to questions for this fund and then we'll move on to the next one. Uh, Representative Paul. Hi, my name is Maggie. I'm the Applied Studies representative. Um, I was just wondering how many times can a student reapply for this scholarship? Is it one time, two times? This is a scholarship that doesn't require an application. This is a scholarship, like I said, as funds become available, we, we reach out to the different colleges or the Office of uh, Adult Learning to be able to get the students for this. And it is a renewable scholarship. So as long as the students are making satisfactory academic progress, they can retain that funding year to year unless we're able to move them into a higher fund. That's the only time that they would not have it the next year. Could you describe a little bit about how being part-time as a returning adult student can affect financial aid and why this scholarship is important given that? Of course. As a returning adult that is part-time, we realize that federal financial aid, most of the parameters are established for full-time students because that's what general federal aid is established for. But if a student's not taking a full-time course load, the amount of federal aid that's available to them is smaller. Even if they're eligible for Pell Grants, that prorates based on the number of hours they're enrolled in. So they're not going to be able to receive the larger amount if they're not a full-time student. We also run into some of these students who maybe they've exhausted all of the federal aid that's available to them, especially with returning adults that have a lot of hours, but now they're coming back to try to finish a degree in something they really want to do. Pell has a, basically a full-time six-year limit, so it's a 600% limit there. We also find returning adults that max themselves out on the availability of federal student loans. So this is another avenue for us to try to assist them and let them finish the degree that they wanted to start. Representative Day. Hi, I'm Grant. I'm the Liberal Arts and Sciences representative on this committee. Um, on page 70 on on the section 3, it's mentioned that uh, you hope to be able to award a minimum of 25 non-traditional students with the funding. Um, I actually have a couple questions about that. How many students have actually received the funding this year or last year and to date, basically? And yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Well, 
Well, I don't have my actual recipient list with me. Um, when we said that we want to award at least 25, that's if they're full-time. That's where the 25,000 falls in. And again, like I said, with part-time students, then we can spread it out farther because they can't receive the full thousand. Um, but we typically have a good mix of full-time and part-time students in this. So unfortunately, I don't have the exact numbers for this year. I base it more on the money that I have available than the number of students. <laughs> If, if you want to uh, email that number to me, I can email it out to the committee later as well. I can definitely give you the numbers of students and is there any other information? I've got, I can give you an average GPA. I can give, you know, any of that kind of information. Sorry, um, I, I was more interested in uh, that and also the proportion of part-time versus full-time students. So yeah, I think that would be helpful. Okay, not a problem. I can definitely provide that. Thank you. Representative James. Um, going off of that, if you could also provide possibly retention rates as well, could that be something you provide? Are you looking at retention rates as far as how many years a student may be able to receive it? Or, or basically like getting the scholarship if they like continue on with their graduate studies is what I'm saying. You mean up to graduation? Yeah, that's what yeah, I mean. Because they sorry. can't have it as a graduate student. Um, but if you look at the paragraph under here, under number two, it kind of gives you an idea of how many times we have graduates in there. Again, I kind of wanted to express that even though we have a lot of seniors that are in this list, a lot of those hours for returning adults aren't counting towards their degree. So even though it may be looking like they should be graduating, they're not. So what I do have is on my list, I can tell how many years that student has had them. And we can kind of track that way to give you an idea of the retention rates. Uh, but this kind of gives you an idea of the graduation rates. Um, all right. Any other questions on this account? Okay. I think we'll move on to the other scholarship, uh, the historically underrepresented scholarship. It's on page 46. Okay. So similar to the non-traditional scholarship, this is funding that is set aside for a specific group of students. This is a fund that we would like to see if we could possibly increase the amounts that we receive. The reason that we're asking this is because we looked over the past five years of the population growth for this specific set of students, and it has grown by about 11%, and that equals up to about $5,000 increase for us to be able to keep pace with the population of the students that fall into these categories. Um, this is a fund similar to the other one. The maximum award that we have is $1,000. But for students that fall into some of these categories, um, that $1,000 can actually make a lot of difference. This is a source of funding that we're able to use for a lot of our undocumented students that do not have access to any other types of funds. So we know that they're high need students. We try to look for those. But we also try to break it up to where we have students represented from a number of different underrepresented groups. We don't want to have just one specific group represented within here. So we try to look for a mix. Um, this is also a fund. A lot of times when we have students that come to our office that they have financial aid, but they have just that one little gap, that something, just that little bit more that may help them pay for textbooks or that may help them pay for other things that are going on in their lives. Again, it's a stepping stone. It's a small amount that we can put on here that allows us to see those students progress throughout the years and allows us to move them into those higher funds once we can see that they are actually progressing and moving forward. So these two lists help us a lot to try to locate those students when it comes time for us to do renewals. Um, this again, just underrepresented, I mean, it, it sounds like a very large blanket, but that's because there are a lot of students that do fall into these categories. 
we try to find students that are minority students, whether whatever that minority might be. Um, we try to find students that are high need students. Again, this is something they don't have to have a 3.0 GPA to be able to be eligible for these funds. So if we have students that can start off at the basics, if they're struggling with things, we can work with them to get them the services they need but also be able to provide that little bit um, of additional income um, that can help meet some of those needs as well. Does anybody have specific questions in regard to this? Yes. Uh, Representative Zacharias. Um, for fiscal year 19, was the full 50000 awarded to recipients for this fund? It was originally awarded, um, but since we've just come out of the fall semester, we do still have some funds remaining for the spring as we've had students that have fallen off. Uh, maybe they didn't return or whatever those circumstances might be. So it puts that money back in for us to be able to spend either for the spring or for the summer. If I'm thinking right, I think we have a about five thousand dollars now that's sitting out there so if we break that down to full-time students for just the spring semester you know that's ten students that we can look at um, but again it fluctuates sometimes we need some of those funds for the summer as well there's usually a couple of students that need to take a summer course to meet some other requirements to keep them on pace and maybe that's a fund that we can help fund them for that but we do try to have it all allocated and spent before each fall semester even begins representative stephanopoulos hello i'm a graduate student representative um, i had two questions for you uh, first how many students on average do you receive um, this uh, scholarship per year and second on the second paragraph of page 46, it's referencing section 3.2.2 of S0702. When I Google that, I can't find that particular bill. Can you provide some clarification of what that bill is and what that section specifically talks about? Well, that's the section that was actually in the SGA bylaws. So anything that's quoted in here, unless those bylaws have been updated and we were not made aware of a change, uh, but that's where anything that's referenced here is coming directly from. Um, as far as the students we have right now, we have, uh, this shows 41 students. The reason for that is again, we have that gap uh, of students and this hasn't been updated for a couple of days and I know we've awarded some students, um, but this is a fund where the majority of the students are full-time so we have very few that are receiving half so it's we start off awarding 50 students as full-time and then we have that shift uh, into the spring of students that may fall off and then we have to find additional students to finish out the year i'm going to allow a point of clarification by yeah Gabriel so um, statute 702 actually no longer exists we've merged it into one big scholarship um statute which is uh Statute 103 um, is where all of our scholarships now live, including these. So if you want to look at that, um, it's in Statute 103, the Association Scholarship Statute. Uh, Representative Zacharias. Would you be able to provide us um, how many part-time, full-time students there were for fiscal year 2019? Because that's like said and done for fall uh, 2018 to spring 2019. Yes, I can definitely follow that up just like I'm doing with the other ones. So you're looking at FY19 information. Do you want FY19 information for the non-traditionals or do you want the current years? Um, could you do would both? It, could you do both? Sure. Would it be too much? Okay, sure. Um, do, you, do you have an application for the scholarship or is it similar to the last one where you identify a student and then reach out to them? Yeah, this again, it doesn't require an application. Okay. This is one where we reach out a lot of times to the colleges. We also keep these lists of students that come into our office that are needing additional funds. That's the main source that we get. Um, a lot of times we have students that are 
sent to us, whether it's from their academic advisors or other people that they come in contact with, whatever their situation might be, and these are funds that we can use for those students. So it comes from a number of sources, but if we do have gaps, we do reach out to the colleges or anybody else that may have students. A lot of times we use ODI for this list as well. Are there any more questions? Oh, Representative Zacharias. Um, for uh, question three, when you're talking about the 11% growth in this demographic, is that specific to WSU? Yes. Okay. Any more questions? All right, well, thank you so much for coming in and for all the hard work that you do, and we hope to get back to you soon. Also, um, you can just send them to my email or Gabriel's email, and I'll give it to you after. Okay, okay. I'll make sure to get that information. If anybody else has any other follow-up questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much for the funds that you provide to us. Believe it or not, it does make a world of difference for those students, and it's always nice to see the look of relief on their face when we can say we can help with that. So thank you. Thank you. So we have five minutes till the next one. We're just gonna, if you need to use the restroom or whatever it is, you're, you're welcome to, we'll take a break. Press, press the talking person button and the red light will come on. Touch it, yep. Talking head, you turn it on, and then when someone else is asking a question, if you can turn it.
All right, so it looks like we're all here, so we'll call the meeting back to order at 2.16. So we have, um, at, uh, uh, sorry, we have Campus Rec Recreation here with us, and they're going to present a little bit about Campus Rec, tell us what it's all about, and if you could introduce yourselves one by one so the committee knows who you are. Austin Sanderson, coordinator of competitive sports. Uh, John Lee, director, campus recreation. Uh, Calvin Cup, head rowing coach and director of boats and bikes. Courtney Calder, esports coordinator. All right, um, I'm just going to go over just really briefly kind of an overall arching campus rec where we're at these days and then. Um, these individuals will talk specifically about their programs um, just for a couple minutes or two. So we have plenty of times for questions. Um, a couple of years ago, we came up with a strategic plan um, in 2017. And I just wanted to kind of give you an update what we've done in those those couple of years. Um, if you've been in the HESC Center anytime recently, our front desk has totally been remodeled. And my goal was to get out of the 1980s with a wooden desk and, and add technology to the front area, which we um, which we did. Also strategic in the sense that um, I wanted to have one place where we could check out equipment and have um, a front desk area um, for slow times because we needed to save money and that's a place where I could save money. So it was two things. I wanted to make the place look nice um, because it was, the building was built in 1983 but and I wanted to save money. So the, both of those things have been accomplished. Um, if you go out to our tennis courts, we added a futsal and basketball courts. It's the only place on campus at night where you can play anything outdoors. And it's the only actually on the main campus, a place where there's something meant to have activity. Um, so that was a, a goal and that was reached. Um, as many of you know, we added the eSports hub where the cardio room used to be. Um, that $300,000 project finished in November 1st. Um, um, we got a donation from the Curry family to add an outdoor um, park horse that didn't cost us anything. That was a, um, a family that just wanted to have that sort of exercise. It was here a long time ago, and then we brought it back. Um, we also, um, as Calvin might mention a little bit in, in a minute or two, um, have a new boathouse down on the river, the Arkansas River. Um, we pay $1 a year for it. Um, we know money's tight, and... We're always trying to look to partner with uh, people, and we, Calvin found partners within the city and the River Vista people, and so therefore we have a boathouse. Um, that kind of leads us in the programs. In August, we started this boats and bikes program that's also on the river. Um, our long-term goal is to make money, to get more money for the rowing team. Um, the, the contracts were signed in August, so we were open for half a second last year. So this year would be our first year to dip our toes into the water, so to speak, and and uh, get going. But it's a small business. Uh, we don't expect to make any money this year because we're making contacts and that such thing like any small business. Uh, but we're excited about it, and uh, hopefully it will be successful for us. Um, in December, um, Applied Studies used to run the e uh, sports varsity team. Now Campus Recreation is, and that's what Courtney's here to speak about in a few minutes. Um, it was also my um, intention to make campus recreation more nationally known at Wichita State because I think we do some great things. So we work with the city of Wichita to bring um, the Nursa National Basketball Championship, which, which Austin helps us run. We're in year two coming up in April. Last year we had uh, 80 teams from around the United States and over 100 officials and, and other uh, uh, student, affairs, uh, student affairs slash campus rec professionals from around the country help us run that. Um, most of the games were, all the games were run at Wichita Hoops because our place isn't big enough. So that will be coming up in year two. In a couple weeks, we're going to host the Collegiate Wheelchair National Basketball Championships. Um, uh, that's a different organization, but, you know, we wanted to bring, um, Wichita State is, is um, widely known for being a place that complies with ADA and, and being wheelchair accessible. So we thought that would be a, a good win for our program and, and for the city. Um, we also added fun things like outdoor adventures where we go on ski trips and um, whitewater rafting into Royals games. Um, that just breaks even, doesn't cost us anything, and fun things like Fright Night. 
um, specifically about uh, budgets now. Um, campus recreation, all we're, all we, we're, we're requesting that we get $4,575 just for benefits. If benefits wouldn't have gone up, we would have asked for zero. So no addition there. Um, I think it's worth noting that um, we've been preparing for two to three years to take some financial losses, which we have been taking. Um, for example, um, if you're a faculty staff person and you join the Y, you get to use the Heska Center for no extra cost. Well, that costs us money because we're no longer buying memberships. So that's costing us in the long run, that will cost us $70,000 per year to have basically people use, faculty and staff use the Heskin Center for no additional cost. Plus, we're serving members of the community who are just Y members who want to come in. Um, but we haven't done much advertising, and it's only been a month and since the first day of school or a little bit more. We've had about 200 people take advantage of that. So, um, but that's with no advertising or anything like that. Um, we also um, help the university um, by paying $35,000 per year for Woosley Hall. So we've got cut, so that could be built. Um, we um, also no longer do personal training. That made us around $15,000 a year. So we don't have that income anymore um, because that went to the Y. Um, and then the last two years, we were very fortunate to get whatever SGA gave us the last two years, but they never gave us the entire amount of our benefits. So the last we took in minor little cuts in our operating the last couple of years as well. Um, to mitigate all that, we are two full-time staff people less than we used to be, and we took a third person and moved them to another uh, operation, uh, the boats and bikes area. So we're down to full-time. Um, we also cut student staff salaries, not salaries, but student staff, um, the number of positions because of the front desk thing, because we needed to cut more money. Um, we also cut a GA because um, I needed to balance all what I just mentioned. So that's that's uh, campus rec. Uh, the capital account, um, we, we request $25,000 every year and um, no different, no change this coming year. That is the same number. Um, sometimes it was less, we've gotten less, but we've not asked for an increase since Ronald Reagan was president. Uh, so, and that's a fact, that's not just, so it's been in the 80s since that number has gone up. We use that money to buy our bigger things and it really doesn't pay for like two or three things this year. We bought a, a pool vacuum cleaner over $5,000. We had to replace the parts on the vacuum cleaners that clean the gym floors, which you ride in because our gym is, is 56,000 square feet. You know, that was several thousand dollars. We had to replace a part on HVAC unit that physical plant wouldn't repair, that was $15,000. Um, we would like to um, put in dividers, these are just some of the examples that we could use the money for, dividers in the men's showers. Currently it's just open, and because we're gonna have YMCA kids this summer, I think it's important to have dividers in the showers, not just an open thing. Um, so Emily Patterson's group over at Financial, financial uh, Facility Planning are helping me to design something so we could have an area that could be able, and we're not, there's currently 18 shower heads, we're only gonna have two or three dividers. So those are the kinds of things, and believe me, we spend that in about two seconds. Our other plan sometimes though is when we specifically see something and we got a cost, sometimes we'll not spend at all that year and add up our 25 to 50 or 75, wait three years to pay for some big expenses because um, it, things cost a lot more than $25,000. Um, so that's the uh, capital account. Rowing is just asking for benefits um, as far as um, um, their um, request, $4,154. One thing to note here is that um, Rachel, who is an assistant rowing coach, we did give her, we're not asking this money from y'all, um, $5,000, so slightly less than $5,000, um, we had to add to her salary because she was not making the federally mandated minimum for exempt employees, which meant we had to pay her hourly. And we could not afford to pay her uh, overtime every time she went to a regatta for a weekend. Um, so that was either leave her at home, which doesn't help us, or pay the overtime, which we couldn't afford, or pay her 4000 some odd dollars to get her above that minimum. None of our employees make, you know, 
tons of money. Um, so, um, sport clubs, we're not asking for anything additional. We have about 15, and Austin will talk about sport clubs in a minute, 15 um, different sport clubs. We used to ask for 35,000 a few years ago. Um, it was dropped to 30. So that, on, on average, is about $2,000 per club if you break it out like that. Some clubs get more, some could get less, but easy math there. Um, then the eSports uh, varsity team, this is the first time we presented on this. Um, the only money we have currently in that account is for the coordinator's salary. So we are asking for $6,271 to have money to pay for travel and stuff. And one day, the computer's only a year old, but three years will go by before you know it. And there's got to be some amount of money to, from somewhere to pay for those type of things. It is our hope in the future to, to go out and um, ask companies um, for more money, but um, it's a lot of hours to put in and, and run the club as well. Um, so that's, that's uh, it overall. So I thought I'd start with Calvin with rowing real quick. Yes. Well, thank you for having us. And, you know, we have a couple of minutes each to talk about our programs. And I always find that kind of a daunting task. So where do you start? You know, how do I tell you all the things that we're doing over the course of a year with our program? And the truth is we just can't. There's no way we can cover everything. So I'm not even really going to try to just quickly go through the whole list uh, of things that we do and, and, and all of the programming and how we spend our money and all that give you all an opportunity at the end to ask questions because I'm sure each of you have things that are important to you that you want to know about so we want to make sure you have that opportunity but what I what I will say is I'll just address it just in general and this is not just a sentiment for rowing but but for my opinion of, of all of campus rec I'm just really excited about what we're doing with all of our programming and how we're expanding that programming and changing you know we have to grow we have to meet the needs and we have to be prepared for the challenges that we have as, as they come about. Revenue, for example, the changing, you know, interests that students have and what they want. You know, the, we talk all the time about student experience. We talk all the time about applied learning. What are you as a student, what are we as faculty, staff getting out of those experiences? And so the, the projects that we've been working on beyond just having a collegiate competitive program, I think really identify and, and are testaments to that, you know, being able to, to get the boathouse and get it funded with outside <coughs> revenue streams without coming and asking for any money for that was a daunting task. Understanding that we have to generate revenue ourselves, especially for the programs that we want to compete against. And because rowing is an open sport, we're not just competing against sport clubs or other independents. We're competing against other D1 and D2 programs and D3 NCAA programs. And if you know what those budgets are, you know, uh, we're talking probably 1.5 million for women's rowing at a big time D1 women's program. And over the past eight years, there have been 15 between D1 all the way down to junior college programs that our best boat has beaten their best boat. And so we know we can compete. So those revenues and those, that extra fundraising and the endowments that we're starting, all of those are to help us get to the point where instead of it being 15 teams, next time it's 20 teams or 25 but not just for our competitive athletes, but also we've started a recreational program. Now the Boathouse allows us to do that so that any student, they can take one credit hour, and they can come on and row now. We'll teach them how to row. We couldn't do that before without a facility. Our connections with the community, our partnerships with River Festival, our partnerships with the Park Board, all of those things, and we're partnering, I have a meeting tomorrow with Exploration Place reaching out into community, impacting the community in ways that we couldn't before. We have a responsibility and we know that. And Boats and Bikes is critical to that. And that's open to not just students and faculty and staff, but the entire community. You know, any type of programming that we can think of, we can host there. And we're really proud of doing things and that, are, that weren't done before. New ideas, creating something from nothing and involving our students in that and not just a small section, but creating opportunities where a larger segment of our student population and university community can now be involved. Everything from we've hosted human resources executive team at a team building workshop there. You know, we're bringing in other junior college programs for, for things. 
for recruiting and other stuff. So what we're trying to do is reinvent and figure out what can we do to impact our community, to impact our, our students and our university, and do it while we're helping support ourselves and hopefully represent our community and our university well. And that's it. All right, going quick talk about sport clubs. Uh, so some of the goals that we had um, was we created an executive board, another opportunity to give students uh, applied learning opportunities within the sport club program. Um, so these are individuals that have led their clubs, um, helped manage their budgets. The executive team helps oversee the $30,000 budget and allocate those to all 16 other clubs. Um, and then we increased uh, student engagement with increasing our um, opportunities for students to participate in clubs that they enjoy. So we went from 10 um, to 16 clubs. Um, so those are t always two of our goals is increasing engagement and then other opportunities to um, give them additional learning opportunities outside the classroom. Um, and so not sport clubs isn't always going to align with someone's major, but it's an opportunity for them to step outside the classroom and if they're going to be part of it like a not, I look at it as a nonprofit. If they're going to be part of a nonprofit and help them fundraise, um, like we did, we did a pancake feed. That's something that they can apply to their, to their future, not in their job or field, but some of their other interests. Um, so engagement and applied learning are always goals one and two. And then uh, goal three kind of just depends on the year. Um, but I focused on some risk management and uh, we did some research as far as how can we improve their experiences on the risk management side. Um, so we did some research into looking to, into athletic training for our uh, student athletes. Hello. Um, all right, so with our eSports program, currently we have four competitive varsity pro, uh, teams. So we do carry a League of Legends, an Overwatch, a Rocket League, and a CSGO team. Um, our CSGO team is ranked nationally. They are 10th in the nation currently. Um, and our Rocket League team is entering playoffs. Um, we do carry uh, some travel components to that as our CSGO team will be traveling to Dallas this uh, April for a tournament. And our League of Legends team currently travels in a competitive league uh, up and down the Midwest. Um, we carry 24 varsity athletes and three additional varsity, excuse me, four additional varsity student coaches. So kind of to piggyback off of the applied learning aspect, we do want to give our students an opportunity to take on the responsibility as a student coach, as well as give them that chance to kind of talk about player development and uphold our values with that holistic approach to learning and development for players. Uh, what that means is that our students are going to be having requirements for physical fitness, nutrition, and GPA requirements. Uh, we will be partnering to make sure that they are not just sitting in front of a video game for four or five hours on end. We want to make sure that they are a holistic student athlete and that they're held to those standards across the board. Um, we are also working at community partnerships uh, within the Wichita, greater Wichita area. Um, so we are currently partnered with Southeast High. They do run their uh, League of Legends and Overwatch teams here um, in our hub. Um, it gets students on campus, which is something that we want to do. It focuses on recruiting and retention as well. Um, we will also be putting together a name's kind of to be determined, but um, it is a recruiting event for League of Legends and Overwatch students within the area where we will have a tournament for them to come on campus on a two-day a weekend event uh, where they will compete competitively, and it also gets shockers, future shockers, hopefully an opportunity to see what campus is all about. Um, going forward, we also have partnerships that we're focusing on with Exploration Place. Um, when we look at our summer camps throughout the summer, we want to give junior high and high school students an opportunity to know what gaming is about outside of that five hours in the basement kind of feel. We want them to know that there is a way to develop characteristics of a, um, a competitive but yet that's the right word here. So we want to make sure that they understand that communication is key. Um, so when you're talking about a group of five players, most of them don't play with other people together. So we have some type of a toxic environment that can occur. And we want to help overcome that. So communication is a huge thing that we want to focus on with the uh, incoming summer camps and students that we want on campus. Um, and this allows them that. Um, partnering with Exploration Place also gives us an opportunity to show them that there is 
outside of outside of being inside of the hub on campus that you can see technology advancing um, in other areas. Um, and finally, um, out, uh, we also talk about community events. We want to put on um, a few things with uh, Alzheimer's Association where we get um, the longest day here on campus where our students are able to play for um, obviously with breaks, uh, but for a long amount of time and hopefully fundraise. Um, we want to show that we're more than just video games. We want to be competitive. We want to have student athletes be successful, but we also want to know that the community to know that we're here for them and um, that together we can be a holistic program. Thank you. So we'll open it up to questions. Does anyone have any questions for any of our presenters? Uh, Representative Hall. Hi, I'm Maggie, and I am the Applied Studies representative. I did have a question for WSU crew. Is there a hope that one day it will be taken over, like the rowing team would be taken over by athletics, or do you want it to stay underneath, like, campus rec? Well, that's that's a, quite a question there. Uh, what I can say is that the, the experience I've had, we've always been under student affairs and, and within campus rec, and, and I know that we run a quality program where we are as to whether we would be part of the ICAA and under athletics, that's really not something that, that I would have the say in. That's going to be determined at a little bit higher level than, than I am. What I can tell you is that if I'm involved in that, then our goal is the same goal it always has been, is to run the best quality program that I can based off of the resources that were provided. Representative Wright. Howdy. My name is Walter. I'm the business representative. I have a question for the eSports team. So right now you have no budget at all for traveling. So currently, have you have you just not traveled to any events? Have you made the members pay? I, I'm just wondering how that's that's kind of been so far without having a travel budget. Absolutely. Um, no, our students don't pay. Um, I would actually like to defer um, to Dr. Hall. <laughs> Dr. Hall. So, um, Walter, on the, the sheet that I sent to Colleen and to Gabe, it, it, it identifies $7,500 that I allocated out of the $100,000 for student affairs last year that would pay for some jerseys, would pay for travel, and do some of those kind of things. Okay. Thank you. Just a, a quick, also with Tyler, um, who's a, um, left for better opportunities, we took some of his salary just for this year. It's a one-year thing and used it for travel as well because... Uh, we don't pay Courtney as much as we pay Tyler. <laughs> um, I have another question for Varsity Esports. So how many students would you, just a rough estimate if you have it, like use the gaming room outside of, you know, the, um, the team? Just to clarify, are we talking about the hub or the Varsity room? Oh, is, are there two? I didn't realize. There yeah. are, yeah. Okay, so is the Varsity room specific for the specific to the team it is yeah so you would is. you would i could only really give you those numbers which okay. would be about yeah. 24. 24 yeah okay could campus rec tell me about the hub um from about uh, monday through friday um, from about 11 a.m to 7 p.m i say we have about 15 to 16 people normally as long as it's not a vacation or yeah. a snow day or stuff like that so it's been i've been really excited about how many people have used the room um and you know, it takes a lot of uh, time to make sure that the room is being um, kept up more than I thought. So, uh, but no, we're really excited about the numbers, um, the number of people use it. I think it would be hard to, we can get those numbers uh, specifically, but if you guys have logged in, we only use one single login. Yeah. Um, the esports community is trying to catch up with like this cafe or hub type setup that we have. Um, so, Getting those numbers, I can't tell you if John logged on or Coach or myself. We can only tell you when someone logged in one time. Um, and that has to do with uh, making sure that the games are up to date. So I go in, unthaw the computer, update it, and so then it's good for the whole computer. Whereas if John logs in with his own credentials, the games aren't updated. So the esports community manufacturers are trying to get up to speed with this like cafe and open use. Uh, format um, so the numbers that we would get would just be how many times the, lo the person's logged in we're not able to say like how long did they participate what games did they play and all that stuff so thank hopefully you. that clears it up yeah thank you representative James yeah my question is for campus rec um, with John Lee and my question is 
You talked about the loss that you would get from faculty and staff um, using the Y. It's about $7,000. Do you expect that to grow, and do you expect that to um, be in your budgets for, like, upcoming years because you're facing that loss? Um, I, I, I've, I've known this for a while, I believe, and so, we, like I said, we mitigated against it. So this loss is going to be a loss. I don't think we're going to lose much more dollars because, you know, you could aggregate five or 10000 but – we can figure that out. So we, through um, student staff cuts and full-time staff cuts, by the way, we didn't get rid of anybody. They just, when they left, we didn't rehire them. Um, that should take care of it as long as we don't continue to take cuts. Because at this point, most of our budget, whether you, I don't know if you really looked at it, is people. And, you know, we have stuff, but it's mostly people. So, um, and you have to have some money to, to have a, a program like Intermural. So um, at this point, we'd have to get rid of people if we took significant cuts from this point out. But to answer your question, as long as we don't take um, further cuts, we should be fine. Um, so when the contract with the Y was figured out, did they um, ask you to take on those staff members without payment for the membership does that no make sense? I I'm gonna say I figured this one out on my own when when it was announced that faculty and staff would get half price memberships if they joined the Y that I knew would affect us I knew the Y being on campus would affect us the half price would affect us because we only charge forty dollars a semester for faculty and staff and then when they said faculty and staff could use the Hess Center for no extra charge if they are a Y member so nobody, did somebody come and tell me that? No. But I think about the budget all the time. If you know me, I, all I think about sometimes is money. So um, so that, so we just plan for it. Um, but I want to say um, it's really been a good partnership, and I really believe for the first time in the history of Wichita State, camp, uh, Wichita State has a full campus recreation program. It takes what the Y has with with their machines and their machine weights and cardio and the group X and all the other fun stuff they run with our five basketball courts because they're two middle school size basketball courts is it enough you know they can't play badminton there you can't have the number of things we do and racquetball and swimming pool and all the programs so again both of us combine and and George is a is a wonderful person and a good administrator who runs the Y and I think we have a good partnership so I'm really um, excited about the future for recreation on this campus. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hall. Hi. Um, so I'm looking in your resources and revenue. Um, campus Recreation Aquatics, it drops very significantly. Can you explain that? Because I know the Y doesn't have a pool. So I'm just wondering, because it was at $41,000 and it dropped down to $4,000. Um, that specific, you're talking about income there. Um, that specific line is um, swim lessons. And so we just changed the way we did it with a company we partner with. We used to collect all the money and then pay all of it back except 15%. So we reversed it where they collect the money and we get the 15%. So it's really no difference in funding. It's just a way, a different way we took the money in. Okay, thank you. Rep Representative Stephanopoulos. Hello, uh, I'm Theo Stephanopoulos, graduate student representative. I also sit on the Health and Wellness Advisory Board, so I'm a little bit more familiar with student rec and some of those issues. I had a couple questions for you. Uh, first, it looks like you guys are being squeezed uh, for your finances quite heavily. On page 170 uh, in section 8, the last bullet, says that physical plant uh, is now charging you guys for items. Um, how much more is that roughly, do you guys think? Um, that's hard to determine because it depends what we ask them for. But um, it's just the way physical plan is, uh, I forget their new name, sorry. Uh, facility services is, that, like when we wanted to paint the hallway, in the past that would just be a no-brainer that they would pay for it, especially since it had, the roof hadn't been painted in 35 years. Now we have to negotiate it. So if they don't want to pay for it, either it doesn't get done or I pay for it. There are other items which they used to do for free, and really, be, to be honest with you, they really didn't have to do it for free, uh, but now they they charge us. So um, 
So we pay a lot more than we used to. Um, they charge us for custodian work on the weekend, which they didn't charge us for in the past, whether they should have or not. I know we're open seven days a week, but when we have a rental particularly, we have to have extra staff, and they charge us $33 per hour per person on the weekends. And if we have a large enough event, we can't go without custodial stuff. So, But I wouldn't want to say that I just felt like we were just, I think for in some ways we were fortunate in the old days that they didn't charge for all these things. But it is being charged now, and we have to pay for it. Can I continue? Um, I'll have Representative Hall follow up, and then, uh, or Terry Hall follow up, and then I'll, I'll kick. So we had a new um, physical plant director start um, in January of 17, the same time that I did, actually a week before I did. And um, what we found during that time was the physical plant wasn't really running very efficiently or effectively and was was in the hole in lots of ways. And so with with his new leadership, with the, they're really working to at least break even. So it, it has made a challenge. I mean, you you could talk to other folks in student affairs and they, they all experience the same thing. It's not, not his fault, it's just he needs to run a business too. Representative Stephanopoulos. I bring this up because you didn't talk about it in detail, but this is part of the sports and exercise and performance studies program, that building. And so this is a way that they're shifting costs away from our tuition dollars being spent for that facility that's used for academics onto the students through student fees. That's how I'm seeing it. I could easily be mistaken about how I'm interpreting this too. The only, um, it would be nice if something was written down, I'll say this, but when, like the, the Heskett Center hallway, if you look at it like I do, it's chipping away, it needs to be replaced. To me, that is a physical plant, facility services thing. But they have a finite amount of money as well. So if it needs to get done sooner than what, sometimes I partner with them, sometimes I beg them, sometimes I just pay for it. It depends on the, the uh, thing because they have X amount of buildings on campus um, to run. And um, uh, But it is a physical plant is supposed to take care of the facility, the roof, the floors, the lights, and of course, we don't always, you know, I always want things done tomorrow, and, but they have to have however, X amount of buildings on campus they have to take care of, so. Could you describe the boats and bikes program a little bit more, what, what it is exactly? The... Sure, sure. Uh, the boats and bikes is, is, is a partnership. We are the management group. We have a management agreement with the River Vista Boats and Bikes LLC. And so when this whole project was getting started about 10 years ago, when, when we were going through the negotiations and trying to work with the city and say, hey, where's Shaka Rowing going to be? Also part of what we talked about is how are we going to activate the river? How are we going to impact the community? And in the back of my mind, I was like, how are we going to generate revenue? So as this project came to you know development and they were looking at a re at a apartment complex and we were able to work with Goody Clancy, the development group, and the consulting firms in the city. Then we we're like, okay, Shocker Rowing's gonna end up with a place in this facility. Then part of the development group that got the bid, they were like, well, we're also gonna help activate the river. And that was that concept of of water activity for for hire, you know, SUPs or kayaks or, or pedal boats. And along the way, the whole time, I was like, hey, we want to run that because we're there. Then we have more control over what's happening at the facility. We also have a larger stake in what's happening on the river. And if you've seen anything that's going on downtown with the legacy group and maybe building a bridge across the river and, and all of those things, and we attend all those meetings also, we wanted to have a stronger voice. And we knew that if we wanted to protect our ability to have a collegiate rowing program, we also needed to be involved and invested and anchored. So all of this kind of came together in that way. We were able to negotiate the management agreement, which is separate than our lease for the facility. And so we run boats and bikes. And so you can have a birthday party there. You can have a team building workshop. You can have a cocktail party in the clubhouse. Or you can just show up and rent a paddle boat for an hour or get a season pass. So there's recreational activity. We're hosting events there. Uh, we hosted a joint event during a uh, river festival called Shocker Fest. We hosted uh, what we called s'mores and oars. 
this past fall where you could come. We had sh free shuttle service from campus for students and faculty and staff. We cooked s'mores outside. We had the paddle boats out. We gave tours of the facility. So what we want to do is just like what Campus Rec is doing, just like what we're doing with the sports and, and intramurals and sport clubs, we want to create more opportunities for our, our university community. We want to connect with our, our city community and we want to help enrich all those lives and at the same time the truth is we need to make some money that's just the truth we talked you were talking about money where's this money coming from how are we impacting student fees well this is this is a way for us to generate revenue long term now granted we really haven't generated much revenue but we didn't get a chance to really be open and we are the only group doing this so we're out ahead of anybody else and if you haven't been to the facility just let me know I loved giving tours. We have almost 9,000 square feet of facility there, and it is incredible. Thank you. That was a very good explanation. Also, John, um, I've heard a lot of wonderful feedback about the outdoor program, um, the adventure program, right? Could you describe that a little bit and what that is to the students here? Um, it was just... Uh, an idea that a lot of campus recreation programs do and we do it a little differently than some because we're right we're not right next to the, a mountain or an ocean and things of that nature but I just felt like there are people on this campus that especially international students but local people that never gone anywhere and I thought it'd be fun if we took them to Oklahoma City or to go whitewater rafting because they have that made man-made one or go snow skiing and you know the over spring break uh, things of that nature and so basically we charge what it cost us you know we don't it's not a program out to make money and we we do it on the I don't want to say on the cheap but that's what I want to say um, we take vans we 15 passenger vans and full-time professional drives it and so we go we go places like that take them to the Royals game we went to the uh, Oklahoma City Thunder versus um, the Boston Celtics game and and so we looked for fun see if we were going to do a horseback riding out on the um, the Flint Hills but it was too cold the day we was uh, um, so we're always looking for stuff we try to make it where it's um, when we go to the Royals game we get the cheap tickets so people can afford it more um, so any more questions representative Zachary is um, about <clears throat> Sorry, about how many different events does the eSport varsity team travel or plan to travel to? Um, um, so currently we have uh, four away games or matches uh, for my League of Legends team. That's not including playoffs, which would be an additional turn. And then my CSGO team is looking to travel to Dallas. So we're only looking at about seven to eight times uh, this semester, um, obviously going forward. I, I would love to get them out and get them those experiences, but it is depending upon cost. Uh, Representative Naramore. Hi, my name is Ambrosia Naramore Winfrey. I'm the freshman representative of student fees. I was just wondering, you mentioned, uh, Varsity Esports mentioned that they were in the process of maybe considering looking into sponsorships. If sponsorships were pursued, what would those sponsorship, sponsorships cover? Would they cover equipment or uniforms or traveling expenses? I'd love all three. Um, but I think it's depending upon the type of sponsorship that we can get. Monetary is very difficult. So it is a lot of trade or a lot of gift in kind. So I, I would love apparel. That's, that's a really easy one for us um, to kind of have that and get them their gear and get them you know, looking like shocker student athletes. Um, and then we would also love to have travel. Um, that would be a huge one for us. But I think looking longevity, if we could have the um, ability to cover any type of cost associated with the care of the computers, that would be ideal. Um, technology changes and moves rapidly. And to be able to um, kind of, I would say, provide but also be ready for that would be nice. Representative Zacharias. Um, for these eSport varsity uh, trips, about how many students go on the trips? Um, it's usually by team. So currently we have anywhere from six to seven students that go. Um, for the team that travels currently is our League of Legends team, which is a five-person uh, five team. And then we have uh, the student coach and myself. So that would be seven. Um, I have a question about intramurals. So you said you added six, six sports, is that right? Um, or six new sports? What were they? Uh, we added uh, s 
Is your question about sport clubs or intramurals? Sport clubs. Sport clubs. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so the six we added are water ski, baseball, basketball, uh, men's and women's volleyball, and ultimate frisbee. Any more questions? All right. Well, thank you. Oh, yes. Um, I just uh, just really quickly um, something Dr. Hall mentioned before that it started, but our our um, carryover or our reserves at the end of the the fiscal year I project to be one hundred eighteen thousand um, dollars. I think it was it looked like three seventy four, but that's just because things were encumbered and. To me, they're off, but then they go back on. They go back off. It's a budget thing. But, but 118,000 because of the, um, the esports hub and the um, front entrance project are off the book. And and just so you know, um, um, as you probably know already, when something happens in the Hess Center, it's really expensive. And so, so I always feel that the campus recreation should have around 100 to 125,000 minimum each year, just so if some pool park breaks we can replace the pump um, um, or anything else in the Heskett Center our two just there are three volleyball uh, systems that hang from the ceiling they're twenty five thousand dollars each and they've been there since 94 and so they're going to be needed to replace one day so I can go on and on but um, but I, I, I'm thinking 118 thousand is what we'll have left over in the campus recreation main budget and just a point of information uh, to remind everyone on the committee, that's pretty standard for uh, the organizations that have physical buildings and equipment to keep up. So the Radican has a very large reserve for that purpose as well. So, well, thank you so much for coming in and for speaking with us. And thank you for all the hard work that you do. Good luck with everything next year. We have... Two minutes before the next one, but. Thank 
question, just click on <laughs> they brought a parent. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So we're all gonna we're gonna get started. We have the Child Development Center here to tell us a little bit about what they do and what their request is. Um, so I'll have all of you introduce yourselves, and then you can just jump right into what you prepared to present. Well, I'll start first. My name is Jillian Hofer, and I'm the director of the Child Development Center here on campus. Um, so I've been there about 20 years now, um, not always in director capacity, but that's how long I've been here. Um, and I'll let these guys introduce themselves as well. So, My name is Michelle Jarbo. I'm the assistant director um, at the Child Development Center. I've been there for 13 years, and again, like Jill, not always in... Um, a leadership position. I was preschool teacher for a while. So. My name is Tess Shaw and I'm a student here at Wichita State and I'm also the lead um, teacher assistant in one of our toddler classrooms and I've been there for, I was there for a little bit for about a year and I left and I've been back now for about a year again. My name is Ashley Cervantes and I'm a parent of two children at the Child Development Center um, and I'm also a graduate student here at WSU and an employee. So I'll just kind of start off, just give you guys a little background. So um, student fees, what we use that money for um, is essentially three things. Um, so the first thing and the biggest portion of what our student fees goes for is our teacher assistance. So it helps pay for um, their wages um, working. Right now we have about 46 teacher assistants who work for us, um, most on a part-time basis. We like the longevity of our um, teacher assistants, and part of that is due to, um, I wouldn't say a great wage, um, but it's, it's a wage that um, is somewhat comparable. We would really like to pay them a little bit more, <laughs> which I'm sure Tess can attest to, but um, you know, we really try to give them a, a comparable wage. Um, and then the second portion of what our student fee money goes to is our students um, who bring their children to the CDC. So they all get a, um, a, a discounted rate. So everyone um, taking six credit hours or more will get that rate. Um, if they have an EFC of zero, so based on their financial aid eligibility, then they get an even further discounted rate. So the difference is made up by SGA dollars. So that's what, what pays for that. And then also in the summertime, um, if we have students who are not taking classes in the summer, uh, they then student fees picks up their tuition in the summertime so that they don't lose their, lose their spot because that's a lot of money <laughs> to not, not be coming in and paying. So, And then the last portion, which is a smaller portion, um, goes to a little bit of our uh, lead teachers fringe benefits um, and any mandatory raises. Um, so we really try to keep our tuition down and as affordable as possible, mostly for our, our students, um, but then also for so we can support our WSU community as well. So being able to um, have someone help kind of supplement um, their salaries, I guess, if you will, in that way, um, is super beneficial to to our budget. So that's kind of what our student fees money goes to in a nutshell. So what I'll do now is I'm going to actually have um, Tess talk a little bit, and then Ashley talk a little bit after Tess, and then, um, you know, obviously we, we can open it up to any questions at all that you guys have. Um. Well, I just want to say, like, I really love my job a lot. Um, I love working with kids and getting the experiences that I get there. Um, I am an early childhood unified major, so not all of the experience that I get there isn't um, just professional. It can also be, like, personal experience, too, that I can take with me in the future as I become a parent. Um, 
I have built really strong relationships with the children that I work with and then also the families that I work with. It's really interesting um, when I have parents that I run into at intramural games or in class and you just know them and um, you can kind of build relationships with them outside of work, so that's really cool too. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned when I introduced myself, I did work at the CDC um, a couple years ago um, as a teacher assistant, and I had left because I thought I could do something different, um, something that would still work with my school schedule, and I would just get different experiences. Um, and I ended up coming back to the CDC, and one of the main reasons was because of school. Um, the other job that I had wasn't working with my schedule, and they basically told me I had to quit school if I wanted to stay there. And that was not what I wanted to do. So I got in contact with Jill, and she was like, of course, we want you to come back. And so I came back, and it has just been amazing how I can just go to them. I can go to Michelle, and I can say, this is what I can work, and this is what I can't work because of school. And she says, okay, great. And she gives me as many hours as she possibly can. And they're so supportive when we need to take more time off because we have um, extracurriculars for a certain class that we have, like, um, more expectations we have to meet for that class. They're more than willing to try and help us get some time off so we can go meet that um, expectation for that class. Um, and I've um, just really enjoyed working here. Um, it's a really good work environment. Um, the people that we work with are amazing. Um, are all, both Jill and Michelle are so supportive and um, the lead teachers that are also there are so supportive in school and helping us like understand that we're going to make it through and it's okay to be stressed out and in life in general they're always there when we need someone um, what I do make at the CDC um, goes towards the bills that I have to pay it is the only job I have just because of my school schedule it is not very flexible um, I have to take a lot of time off um, so the money that I make at the CDC is what I use to pay the bills that I have so Um, from a parent perspective, I just want to kind of make two points. So um, I think when you're having a kid, they tell you you're going to lose sleep, right? Um, <laughs> the two things that were most surprising to me, I think, were uh, how hard it is to drop your kid off with somebody um, who's not family and then how expensive child care is. Um, so I want to talk about those two things. Um, so, you know, at the Child Development Center, it's not like a daycare. You don't just drop them off and it's chaos all day. They have goals that they meet, even as infants. Um, and so, and they're pretty personalized, and that's just really great. Um, we get emails about what the kids do all day. So when they come home, I can say, hey, how was science today? Um, and so it's pretty cool that way. Um, we get happy grams that are really fun. Um, so this is my daughter. This is for Valentine's Day. Um, and so it's just really a great place, and I feel super happy dropping them off um, every day. Tess looks after Marin, and she is phenomenal. Um, and so um, the second thing, um, after we had Marin, we joked that I was paying to go <laughs> to, go to work. <laughs> um, but from a professional perspective, you know, I really didn't want to stop my career to, you know, to, to have kids. And so it was really great, you know, to be able to, you know, I'll pay to go to, to go to work, I guess. You know, I like what I do. Um, I work in a trio program here at WSU. Um, and so, you know, nonprofit, it doesn't pay a lot, but I like what I do. Um, and so um, I also wanted to keep continuing to develop professionally in it and through education. And so um, when I was looking at um, coming into this doctoral program, you know, cost was a big decision. And so having the ability to have that discounted tuition rate is just awesome too. And it really helped me make the decision to move forward with that too. And so, um, you know, a lot of benefit here at the Child Development Center, I think. Perfect. Um, does anyone have any questions? Representative Hull. Um, whether you can provide it now or you can send it to Colleen after, can you just give us a breakdown of like costs for how much it takes, how much a staff member or faculty member before the discount has to pay um, to send their child to your facility? 
Yeah, I can definitely send. We have a nice brochure that breaks down everything from what an infant would pay for a community and then a staff or a student with a regular discount and then a student with an EFC. Um, and that's also found on our website as well, um, which would be easy to pull up too. But I can definitely send the brochure um, so that you guys can, can look at that because it does give a lot of other information as well. So, yep. Any other questions? Representative Wright. Yeah, so on the form you list 12 student families who benefit from tuition assistance. Is that the sort of extended tuition assistance, or is it just the normal level that every student is eligible for? It's a mixture. Um, I can break it down for you if that's something that you would like, but it is a mixture of um, whoever receives. And that's 12 student families, but some of them could have multiple kids that are receiving that discount because it's not per family, it's per child. That's, that discount is broke down. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Representative Stephanopoulos. Hello, uh, Thimio Stephanopoulos, graduate student representative. Um, I was curious about um, how much do you collect from tuition for the revenue that you generate? from all the families and then how many total children do you guys uh, administer and how many of them are Wichita State students? Right now we have a total of 83 students and out of that we have 12 student families. Some of those may be multiple like for instance Ashley has two kids. Um, I lost what your first question was. Oh, our budget. So anything that is outside of the requested student fees is generated through tuition. So we get no state dollars, I guess, if that's what you're asking. We get, we get no support that, in that way. What I mean is, what's the total tuition that you collect for the total amount? I would, I would have to look that up, but if, if you, I can give you what our total budget is, and then you would just take minus the, what we get in student fees, and then that's the tuition that we generate. Mm -hmm. I can send that for sure. Representative Hall. Um, uh, in one of your questions, we asked um, for reserves, right? I understand reserves right now is a snapshot. Um, they always tell us that. Um, but you have two hundred or yeah, two hundred four thousand dollars. Do you have any ex external plans? Because you said you want to keep around a thousand of it. Any other plans for it? So, um, I, that's not actual an accurate amount, as you know. I'm sure it's snapshot. So. Um, a lot of that money is um, saved. So, for instance, we have to save that money in reserves. Um, we just got new flooring in the CDC, which is really nice, right? <laughs> um, so, and we're hoping that's going to last us um, a while. New paint. And then um, some of the other reserves that were, we need tire chips, which, if you don't know, we have to have, like, a certain amount of flooring on our playgrounds for protection. Um, and those we have to supplement every three to four years. So, it's time to do that as well. So, that money that's in there, unfortunately, will not be in there. <laughs> It'll be going away. So how many students in total do you have at the CDC, and then how many of those students are children of students that go to Wichita State University? So right now we have a, um, student, our children, we have about 83. And then of that, I know we have 12 student families. Um, some of them have multiple kids, but I can get you the specific number of how many of that 83 is total in the students. Accurate yep. number. Yep. Hi, my name is John. I'm the representation for the College of Fine Arts. And um, this is more so a question for um, all of the College of Fine Arts. Um, I know a considerable amount of people that have children that are within the College of Fine Arts. Mo some of them that I have talked to have not seen um, advertisement or anything for your facility. Um, do you do advertisement? And if you do, what like what does that look like? Um, great question. We don't, um, partially because we have an extremely long waiting list. Um, right now, we have people who are waiting a year to two years to get in, um, just because we don't have this space. Um, so right now, I think, I'll have to get a more accurate number, but I think we have about 74 families that are currently on our wait list waiting for spots. Uh, 
Representative Kirk. Uh, following up with that then, um, do you have like maybe a 10, 5, 10 year plan in the future to expand to a huge facility or something like that? We would love to. We would love to. And actually, yes, we, we're, we're talking about it. Um, as everybody knows, it's a matter of funding um, and how it's going to be financed. But yes, we, we would absolutely love to um, have a bigger facility and accommodate as many kids as we want. <laughs> Representative Day. Yes. Um, okay. So on pa page 101 uh, on under section four, uh, it mentions that it kind of clarifies this is very helpful. The number of students who will assist um, uh, in running the CDC, um, are all of the 50 to 65 students paid and uh, are there more that are involved? Uh, could you clarify that for us? Thank you. I think I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but um, yes. So all those students that are listed um, that are per semester, that those are all paid students. All the ones that are underneath that, so where it says five to students in varying degree fields who do observations, all that below, those are all students who are coming either to get um, practicum or they may be coming as part of a class to get um, you know, hands-on experience with hearing or speech screenings or things like that. So, but the very top um, um, number there that says who are employed by the CDC, those are all paid. And we say by semester because sometimes uh, it shifts during the semester because sometimes people can come in at the beginning of the semester and they can maybe um, find out that working and going to school is too much so they may you know leave um, or we could have an influx where we have you know five new teachers or, or TAs who come in um, looking for a job in varying capacities. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Zacharias. So um, on the funding request that I'm looking at it looks like $7,000 is me being moved from student salaries to permanent salaries. Are the amount of student positions at the CDC being decreased? They are not. That um, They're not. Um, so that item was moved for the, a mandated raise increase. The 1.5% um, was moved from there. So to balance the budget, that's how, how we had to, to move that around. But our teacher assistants, it, it's um, it fluctuates. So it's not like I know I have seven permanent lead teachers there that I have to budget for, but I don't know if one semester I'm going to have 46 TAs or if another semester I'm going to have 32 TAs. I have a baseline where we kind of like to hold it for sure is around 40 TAs, um, but it just depends. So that number can fluctuate a little bit depending on the year. Representative Hull. Um, back to Representative Kirk's um, statement about the wait list. Is there a separate one for students so they're not on like the massive 75 wait list versus um, other folks who might just be from the community? Yes, we have because our first priority does go to students. So we have two separate wait lists, one that is just for students. We go to that list first when an opening comes up. And then if they don't take it, then we go to faculty, staff, alumni, community, and affiliates of the university. So that's kind of how. But yes, we, we separate that into two wait lists. How long is the student wait list? Same, amount of, time. Same amount of time. Yeah, we're, we're looking at, at quite a wait, unfortunately. Representative Stephanopoulos. I had two questions for you. Uh, first, what will happen when the Coke uh, primary school or elementary school, or I don't know what the designation is, opens to you guys? And second, um, maybe the budget office can explain a little bit more. It says mandated uh, raise increases. The What you talked about was 1.5%. What's the classification of your employees, and how does that mandate come about, and things like that? So the first question in regards to um, Coke, um, I, I don't know that that's going to affect us. The The program that they have now is, uh, my understanding, uh, a preschool realm through maybe sixth grade, I think, right now. Um, that hasn't affected us. I don't, I don't see that affecting us. Um, and then as far as the mandated raises, so those are for our um, full-time professional staff, so all of our administration and then all of our lead teachers who are benefits eligible, those are the ones that those, those raises go to. And then the second question I'm going to 
kick to learn. Yeah, and then so last year across the board for all benefits eligible employees at the university, the university mandated a 1.5% pay increase, which was, I think, funded partially by the state and partially from our own resources. And, and, and the Student Fees Committee approved last year the funding of that 1.5% for all the budgets that are RU funded for their people as well. Yeah. Did it, it originated at the state level though, correct? The mm -hmm. desire for the 1.5 increase. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's all we have time for as far as questions goes. But if anyone else has additional questions, we'll just email them out to you as well. Can I, can I yeah. Well, yeah. Well, Jill's still here just because yes. I want to be transparent about this. Yeah. So I've asked Jill to do a long-range plan to decrease the amount of student fee money that, that the Child Development Center re receives. And I'd like it to get down closer to about 20% as opposed to the 30-ish percent that it is right now because of the number of students who have kids in the program are not are not equal to the other students. No fault of their, theirs, but to develop a plan for how we can start reducing that money over time. And then if we, if we get to the place where we have more, more students, then we can, more kids of our students, we can think differently about that. But this is a hard time for us student fee wise and we need to make decisions based on how we're serving the most students. And so just to have us, I just want to put it out there as a, as a, an equity thing for me that we need to have that conversation. Thank you, Dr. Hall. And thank you so much for coming in. Um, and good luck with the rest of the year. And thank you for taking thank care you. of Thank you. Yeah, and if anybody has kids, any questions yeah. at all, just, you know, call me, email me. We're open book. Stop by if you haven't. I'll take you around. <laughs>
Um, good afternoon. I'm Kevin Conda. I'm Associate Vice President for Student Affairs and Director of the Radican Student Center. Hi, I'm Julia Caps. I'm the Finance Director for the Radigan Student Center. Okay, I'll kind of start out and just kind of give a little background of the um, Radigan Student Center, kind of how we operate from that side of it, and then I'll turn it over to Julia, and she'll kind of go through the budget a little bit more in detail on where we're at with that from that side. So then if you've got any questions anytime, just go ahead and ask, and we can kind of take care of it. Um, the Radigan Student Center is what's called 501c3, Controlled Affiliated Corporation of Wichita State University. So we, we operate independently from the university, but we're controlled by the university, if that makes sense. Um, to you guys from doing that. But when I say that we're financially independent from the university, we're responsible for all of our own staffing, HR, um, all of our own benefits, including health insurance and retirement. Um, we're responsible for all of our own maintenance and building improvements. So we have our own maintenance department. Um, if the building needs cleaned, janitorial, we have our own janitorial and cleaning services. Um, we have our own financial office, Julia, obviously is part of that. But basically, as a business we set, we operate completely independent of the university, so we're responsible for all that financially um, from that side of it, okay? Um, we do, we have a combination of student fees and self-generated revenue that's kind of combined into a um, consolidated budget for the, for the Radigan Student Center. And fees are kind of used for every part of it. It's just part of our revenue, so it becomes a big part of our operations. We kind of work hard to try to balance the business side of operating the Radigan Student Center. Um, along with the service side of providing space and the opportunity for the students to make connections. Sometimes that's a challenge. The business side of it, once you want to draw revenue and uh, to make money, the service side of it is, is that we try to balance that with providing the best service that we can, knowing that all the services that we provide um, do not generate funds that go along with that. So try to balance those two together to make it, to make it work. Um, we have the Radigan Student Center is made up of basically nine departments, bookstore, Shocker Sports Grill, event services and the information counter, the Shocker Card and IT Center, marketing, our finance, director's office, plan operations, and the bowling team. To kind of give you the process that we go through, we begin in, this, in the early part of December putting our budgets together. Each department within the Radigan Student Center uh, prepares a budget for their individual departments. And then they meet with Julie and I at the beginning of January. We go through each individual department um, by themselves to kind of go over what the major impacts for the budgets are for their areas, what are the increases, what are the decreases, making sure increases are in line with what our expectations are, and for the operations of the Radigan Student Center. Um, at that point, then, we consolidate everybody's budget into what we call a consolidated um, financial report or a budget for the Radigan Student Center. And then that's presented to a a um, fee subcommittee for our board of directors. The Radigan Student Center operates um, and reports back to a board of directors made up of nine students and nine faculty and staff um, from there. So from that fee, we, we get recommendations from that fee subcommittee, and then we present our full budget back to our full board of directors, um, which happened the first week of February. Um, so at that point, we, we go into detail of what our budgets are, and then they either approve or make recommendations. At that point, they approved our budget um, to move on to the student fees, so that's where we're at now. Just a few notes. We had 1.3 million visitors to the Radigan Student Center last fiscal year. Um, so that we get into the between five and 10,000 visitors per day um, in the Radigan Student Center. Kind of go with some of the projects. Some of the projects that were completed last year um, we, we obviously we put live streaming in this in this meeting room to, to help with SGA and any other you know groups that would need it at about a cost of about twenty five thousand. We replaced two chiller units, which are our air conditioning units. We're, again, we're responsible for all that at a cost of about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Upgraded Wi-Fi throughout the entire RSC. Actually, we just got finished with doing that project. Um, our our Wi-Fi in the building was not capable of keeping up with the. Uh, the amount of people and students that we had in the building, so we had to go through an upgrade to kind of make that better for everybody. Hopefully, it's 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 better for you guys when you're in here. But that was at a cost of about thirty-five thousand. We're actually retrofitting or retrofitted lights in the basement and the first floor to LEDs at a cost of about twenty thousand. Then lights have about a two-year payback in energy savings. Um, just off, just for a note, last fiscal year um, was our lowest usage of the electricity in the Radigan Student Center since 1972. So even though we added 60,000 square feet um, in our last um, remodel, um, renovation, 
our electric bills have actually gone down and not up from that side. Or not the bills, but the usage has gone down. Actually, electricity prices go up, so that offsets some of the, the, the usage going down from there. So um, we replaced all the projectors in the ballroom at a cost of about $40,000. And then we had to build out the Braber and Shocker stores about $200,000. That's kind of in the last fiscal year or so from that. Future projects that we have coming up, we've, we've replaced the projectors, but we have an AV audio system in the ballroom that's actually needing to be upgraded at about a projected cost of about $60,000. Um, technology in, in eight meetings rooms with projectors, including this one, that technology is going obsolete. It's hard to believe we're only five or six years out of construction, but these won't handle 4K or anything above that from that side of it. So it, it tends to have issues when we when we have meetings within those spaces. So um, that's at about a cost of about 12,000 per meeting room. If we go back and just with straight TVs, if we wanna upgrade to go anything better than that, it's gonna be more money from that side of it. We gotta replace our HVA, HVAC energy management and control system at about a cost of 30,000. That's the same control system that gets us to the lowest um, <coughs> electricity usage um, over the last 30 years. Um, RSC furniture replacement, we're going to have to start looking five or six years out. That's probably not an immediate. We're trying to repair what we have in here, but obviously with 1.3 million people in here a year, you have a lot of damage to furniture and those kind of things. The furniture in just, just in the, the um, lounge and public spaces are probably projected at about a $500,000 um, price tag to replace those. Um, Roof replacement on the old part of the building. We also have new part of the building that has new roof, old part of the building, nothing was done to that. It's about at the end of its 20 year life and that cost to replace that, which is again, part of our writing and students responsibility is about um, $400,000 to replace that. So that'll be a project that doesn't need to be done like right now, but it's gonna be coming up here in the new fu near future as we go through it. So. Um, that's kind of all I have for my presentation, kind of where we're at with Radigan Student Center. I, th I think as we go through budget and Julia goes through it, I think the biggest impact on our budget through, through the last five years has probably been in lost revenue um, from textbook sales um, in a university bookstore or the Shocker store from that side of it. Um, so that's really affected our budgets as we've gone through, most of which we have made up for within our budgets over the last five years. So. So that's kind of the, probably the biggest impact that we have um, from a budget standpoint. So, and I'll let Julie kind of take over and go through the budgets from there. Okay, um, in your folder there was a, um, some notes, the major budget impacts as well as a summary. I'm just gonna kind of talk through some of these notes and down through the major categories of the budget. <clears throat> The total revenue in the FY 2021 budget is budgeted at a million thirty-three thousand less than FY 2020. Um, that's really just, as Kevin just mentioned, you know, decline, declining book, textbook sales and usage on campus. Um, there is a little bit of a summary down below this explanation in the total revenue about what all categories were adjusted to get to the. Um, change in revenue there. Um, we, when making that adjustment by a million dollars, we we were cognizant of you know our our actual performance for 2019 as well. So you'll n notice that we um, only budgeted just less than 350 thousand dollars more in revenue than we actually earned in 2019. So um, gross revenue. In the budget is budgeted at five million two hundred twenty nine thousand eight hundred forty four. Um, that is three hundred ninety one thousand dollars less than FY twenty twenty, but also still um, slightly above the twenty nineteen actual by about one hundred twenty two thousand. Uh, personnel. Let's see. Does anybody have any questions on revenue, particularly? We're looking at that. Colleen. Colleen, I don't know how you want to deal with it. Sometimes Sorry, it's easier with our right. budget if we kind of deal with it, break it off in yeah. parts with questions yeah, so absolutely. it doesn't jump all over the place <laughs> and we can deal with revenue and inexpenses um, from that side of it, but it's completely up to you on how you want to deal I'm with sorry. it. I'm sorry, I got lost oh, in looking good. at this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so exciting, right? Um, we, can, we can just go line by line and if anyone has any questions, we can answer the pertinent questions and then have mm -hmm. a longer sorry. question period at the end. Mm -hmm. Yep, so uh, Representative Stephanopoulos. 
Hello, Thimio Stephanopoulos, graduate student representative. Um, when I looked at um, the amount of student fees that were allocated for 2019, 2020, and 2021, the, for 2019 it was 2639000 and then for 2020 it was the same amount, and for 2021 it's uh, 2669000 If I subtract that from your total revenue, would that give me an estimate of your actual revenue that you guys generate yourselves? If you get to the total revenue, if you if you subtract out on the bottom line, so the nine nine million one hundred thirty six thousand one hundred ninety seven, and you subtract the the amount of request two million five hundred sixteen thousand, that would be the rest would be self generated. And so when I did that, I saw that the twenty nineteen amount was around six point three million, and the twenty twenty one amount was about six point four million, and the twenty twenty amount was seven point six million. What's your target for overall revenue for just operating? Is it closer to the 6.5, 6.6, somewhere in there? I would say yes. I mean, it's obviously our, our revenue is all it's all combined together. So we're trying to get to what the bottom line is between the two. Okay. So yes, our target our target would be at least that when we're doing it from that side of it. So, but again, it comes back to the self generated from the bookstore and what kind of revenue they can generate. Same way with the shoppers. Which is highly dependent on so textbook sales. Right. Any other questions on revenue? Okay. okay, we'll skip down to expenses. Um, the personnel expenses, which are under the fixed expenses, are budgeted at 2688000 which is uh, slightly lower than the prior year, and that's personnel expenses. Those include benefits as well as salaries, um, but it's 36000 more than actual expenditures in 2019. Uh, an open position and an additional position, both in the bookstore and both full-time, have been eliminated in this budget. So that makes up for some of the um, decrease in that expense figure year over year. Um, operating expenses in this budget. Well, let's look at variable personnel expenses. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, well, we'll talk about variable personnel expenses, even though they're not a separate line item. <laughs> um, and this section is where we have our student wages as well as our part-time labor. And the part-time labor basically comes about as result of students who work for us during the summer and not taking classes, so they then become a part-time employee during that time frame. Um, so those expenses are budgeted at 598 679 which is pretty flat with prior year, just slightly uh, more than FY 2020, $11,440. Um, and then total personnel expenses, um, does include, as was discussed previously with the previous group, the 1.5% mandatory wage increase that was given to full-time employees um, as a result of the state uh, accommodation for that. that. Right? Yeah, there's a couple things I can clarify within the variable benefits. Um, we, we are independent of the university. Again, we're responsible for our own um, benefits and health insurance, retirement, those kind of things. What we do have with the memorandum of understanding with the university is that we try to follow and, mir and mirror what the university benefits are. So we try to stay as kind of close to them as we can, although it's not dollar for dollar um, every time when we're doing that because it's, it's not always easy to do that. But if, if they give wage increases, we give wage increases on the mandatory side of it. That way that keeps us, it gives us sort of a, a path to follow when we're doing that. So we're not out giving raises all on our own and doing some of those kind of things. And we want to mirror what the university is doing from that side of it. So the other part of that is student wages um, account for about 415000 of our budget um, from that side of it. So we employ about 50, anywhere from 50 to 60 student employees in the Radigan Student Center, which makes up, which makes up that amount from that side of it. So, okay. Any questions on that section particular? No. Okay. You okay. Can keep going. Let's move on down to operating expenses then. Total fixed 
total fixed operating expenses uh, are budgeted at a million sixty-six thousand, which is one hundred and seven thousand less than the prior budget. Uh, we've got several fluctuations going on in there, and there, some of that is happening in service contracts with regard to the plant's office uh, and and uh, in the director's office we've got some funds that have been shifted to another account um, and then the biggest adjustment in the uh, operating expenses is to the utilities and gas and as Kevin mentioned we've been you know doing a lot of things to keep this building energy efficient um, continuing to do that with the lighting so we were uh, we made an eighty two thousand dollar adjustment to the budget um, for FY 2020 to accommodate the actual savings that we're experiencing and hoping that we'll continue to see that and uh, manage that within the rates that will be available to us the variable expenses in this budget are Budgeted at a million twenty-four thousand four hundred ten dollars. That is one hundred ten thousand less than the prior year. There are a lot of different changes going on in that area, but some of the notable ones were in the bank card fees and commissions, um, and the replacement reserve. And the thing to to note about those reductions is they're all revenue dependent. So we've reduced our projected revenue. So each one of those categories of expenses have been reduced relative to the revenue. Uh, that then takes us down to the non-operating revenue and expense. Um, there's several things in that category, which include investment income as well as depreciation and some things like that. It is budgeted. Uh, for 148,000 in net revenue, and that's up slightly from 2020 by 28,000, approximately 30,000. And the majority of that is because I made a, a pretty decent size adjustment to the depreciation allocation in the budget to bring it more in line with what's actually being um, recognized. And you know, the thing about depreciation, it's nice to make that adjustment in the budget, but it is a non-cash adjustment. So it doesn't really change our cash flow. Um, so that's that was made in the other revenue and expense section. Um, this brings us down to a break-even budget of $55 to the good. And I'm going to show that to Dr. Hall when we get to the end of the year. Um, but that said, we have requested an additional $30,000 in um, student fees to help accommodate some of the adjustments we've made in this budget. Um, you know, we did the salary increase basically impacted us to the tune of about 30000 by the time we figure all the full-time people and any impact that has on their retirement and that sort of thing. But the reality is that with declining revenues and textbooks, that's definitely... Uh, impacted the overall profitability of the bookstore as well. So that's probably more of a driving force than anything for um, reduced revenues and um, greater need in this budget. So, Does anyone have any questions? No. Colleen, I was going to talk just a little bit too yeah. about the investment. She mentioned the investment oh, income and, and, and Colleen gets, she, she gets excited about this, but we do have our reserves, and one of the things that we do with our reserves is we put them in short-term investments for the Radigan Student Center, so that in turn um, earns us about $70,000 a year in, in um, investment return on that, so that goes back towards the budget and helps offset student fees from that side of it. So, And also, the Radigan Student Center's budget looks a little bit different because they are um, like their own company, right? So they're not part of the state. Yeah, separate, separate 501c3. 501 yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so they don't have to adhere to the state regulations on budgeting. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for coming in. No more questions, right? Okay. Thank you so much for coming in. If they have any questions, I'll just email them out to you, and uh, we can get the information for them. All right. Thanks for coming in.
unless you actually turn that okay. on. Okay. And then you just talk on it um, so that the people can hear you. Okay. It's on page 239. No, you're, you're good. <laughs> So we have Dr. Colleen Pugh from the graduate school at Colleen. Okay. Um, and then, can you remind me of your name? That's well? okay. I'm Carrie Wilkes, and I'm basically here at her request since these are our funds that I administer. All right. Wonderful. So if you want to just jump right into whatever you have ready prepared to present to us today, and then we'll have a brief question period after that. Okay, so it's my understanding that during this time, we were asked to talk both about the EOF scholarships, McNair and part-time, and then also the $10,000 request um, for the professional development activities. Just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, so basically I wasn't planning on talking that much about EOF um, we've been doing this for so many years and we appreciate the funding and I have seen uh, information about the fact that you all uh, that led me to believe that you all value the EOF process and are in fact wanting to expand it so the graduate school doesn't need expanded funding for these two particular awards right now um, but I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have um, some of the things that come up in the past have been wanting to kind of ensure a wide distribution of funds and as you can see from my write-up that I provided uh, Dean Pugh is we definitely try to award as many people as possible and then we do prioritize new awards over uh, a repeat award shall we say um, so that's basically our overarching philosophy for both the part-time and the McNair award get some money in as many hands as possible does anyone have any questions about the McNair scholarship okay uh, Chris is it um, so for on page 12 when it talks about the EOF graduate student scholarships um, is it just part-time scholarships or is it also full-time so the EOF scholarships the for the funding we receive from SGA it's broken down into two different awards one is for part-time students this is the only award that they are eligible for uh, part-time students as you probably know are not eligible for financial aid they're also not eligible for assistantship so this is basically the only thing that they uh, can apply for and it's limited and then so you have the part-time award and then you also have the McNair award so um, unless so the McNair student would be a full-time award but no it does not go to a full-time graduate student any other questions? by design any other questions? Right. Okay. Well, we'll and move on to the yeah, questions. and so the other um, part is the ten thousand dollar request. I can't remember if this is our third or fourth year um, coming forward with it. Terry saying three, Gabrielle saying three. Um, so we've done some great work with these funds. Um, the graduate school also puts in funding. Is it? I included an Excel spreadsheet so that you can kind of see a breakdown event by event of all of our costs and then you can also tell that 
of course, it does not pay for everything that we do. Um, we have, since the inception of doing the professional development events, we've tripled our attendance. We've tripled the number of events we do. We are pretty lean and as, as far as programming costs go. Um, I leverage a lot of on-campus resources and personal connections to get this programming done at the lowest price possible. Um, Dean Pugh would also like to expand our professional development events that will help us get research grants. So this is an area that's going to continue to grow in the future. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out um, is I know one of my concerns was that I'm making this request, but also I know tomorrow you're going to have a request from the Graduate Student Council that you're talking about. So um, I am knowledgeable about both, and if there were, I anticipated there might be questions as, you know, as like what the difference might be. I could be wrong, but I'm open to hearing those kinds of things. Uh, but basically, this is what the graduate school does on its own. So if, as you saw from the website link I provided, we run events all throughout the year for graduate students. Um, we also have undergraduate students that attend. They're open to everyone. And at one of our events this fall, we actually had more undergrads attend than grads. Um, but um, we just plan on continuing to move forward with that professional development planning and the community events that are so important to our students. Uh, Colleen and myself have been uh, soliciting feedback from graduate students, and even though we have wonderful, wonderful programs throughout the university, one of the consistent forms of feedback that we get from graduate students is that there is not enough done just for them. They want specific tailored events for them. So we're trying to move forward with that in mind. Are there any questions? Uh, Representative Hall. Hi, my name is Maggie Hall. I am Applied Studies representative. Um, how much do you say, like out of this total budget, does the grad school put in versus student fees be putting in with this 10,000? Holy moly. Um, so it looks like uh, this year, if you look at the spreadsheet, there's 16,000. It's not an exact number because we're estimating out for spring events. And then we also have another fund that we dedicate for professional development of events and I believe that was capped at 15,000 that's already been expended so we're at about 15 plus 6 so probably about 21k the grad school's putting in any other questions Rep representative Stephanopoulos hello if you Hi. Stephanopoulos uh, grad school representative um, or a student, grad students representative. I'm curious on the budget sheet on 243, there's one line item for increase in employee health insurance, but then there's no budget for their salaries. There's no budget for any kinds of things like that. Maybe I don't understand the budgets very well. So no, no, yes, no, that's a great question. Um, that was also intentionally left blank. Um, the people that run the professional development are myself and Cherie Smith, and none of that is funded by student fees. So there's no impact to the rising health class because that's a different pot of money. So technically, if you were looking at what portion of professional development is paid by someone else other than SGA, you're going to have to add in some salary costs because there is a full-time dedicated employee that about half of her responsibilities are dedicated to professional development. Representative Kirk? 
Hi, my name is John. I'm the representation for the College of Fine Arts. Hi. Um, for a lot of um, the constituents of mine that are grad students, mm -hmm. um, what they have, what I have been told is that a lot of the events that we do, that you guys do for grad students and everything, <clears throat> they're relatively generalized for their um, for all degrees and whatever. My question is, how um, how can we? How do you do your events, and how do you um, generalize them to specific? Um, specific degrees because what my constituents are telling me is that a lot of like, music degrees conducting however they see that their money is going into something that doesn't even benefit them at all great great question so that is true the professional development series that we run is a little bit broader okay by design um, I would like to push back and challenge that it's not useful um, what our focus for example this past year has been on is workforce development skills so trying to help graduate students not all of the events but there's a pretty significant percentage of our events that are designed to help graduate students be more marketable when they get a job um, and we definitely think that that applies to anyone, no matter what program they're in. We also work a lot on the soft skills, so doing presentations. And again, it doesn't really matter what your program is. You're going to need to have some of those soft skills. We've also developed badges related to that workforce development. So for example, um, ideas about leadership, ideas about taking something that might be thought of only being applicable to the sciences and showing how it could be helpful to learn that and apply it across the board. So for example, last week's professional development event was on design thinking. Now, um, could someone that is in conducting think, I don't need to know about design thinking? Absolutely, they might think that. And we try to tell them, no, this really is for you. Please come anyways, you'll learn something. We have time for one more question, Representative Stephanopoulos. No, okay. All right. Oh, uh, Representative Berth. All right. So you mentioned you left a few things on the budget request purposely blank, and I'm looking at the revenue section. Uh, is there a reason why you didn't include any revenue that you guys have, as opposed to the previous years? Uh, can't recall. I can certainly include that in the future. Uh, basically, we try to run as lean as possible to get the 10K covered, and there are other things that we're required to do that um, that we pay for. And so I can certainly, in the future list some of those out of what other groups, mainly the graduate school, contributed. I think, sorry, this, this is what happens when you get old. The glasses are only good for far away. It makes it worse. Okay, so actually the, oh, they're asking about that page. Oh, my apologies. Where on this page? Sorry. So just to clarify. Th I think that all that was filled in for that page was just the $10,000 request. They didn't fill it out for their entire graduate school org. Yeah. And um, that 22000 you see for health benefits is automatically calculated, so they wouldn't even have input that either. I Oh, if we're talking about this, the um, student services funding request that came from came from Lauren <laughs> it was my understanding that the only thing we were supposed to fill in was the requested amount and the other streams are not part of the professional development event I don't I, I might not have answered your question I, yeah. All right. I think that's unless you want to clarify more Lauren 
just, I mean, I for the whole graduate school, they do so much more than just this. So they, I think, are just making the ten thousand dollar like student fee request. Didn't go ahead and fill in the rest, and yeah, yeah you guys do so much more, and yeah. it's outside of the purview of all that. Right. All of those other funds are other aspects of the graduate school. And I just want, is there any confusion I could clarify? I'm not going to be here tomorrow. I'm going to be lobbying in Topeka with grad students. Is there anything I could clear up about GSC versus what I do? Um, I'm sure Gabriel can also help when I'm not here tomorrow. Thanks, Kate. Well, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you all and everything you've done for grad education. It's really appreciated. Thank you. I'm going to go into recess for... Yeah, 12, 11 minutes, yeah, so 4.15.
push the talk button one tap just to
We all ready? All right. So this is for Shift Space Gallery, and I wanted to thank you for coming in. And then could you briefly introduce yourselves and then talk about a little bit about um, your request, just present whatever you have ready to present. Should I start? Yes. Hello, I am Carter Bryant. Um, I am the president of the Shift Space Student Group and have been a gallery assistant for three years now. Um, student group leads uh, workshops and creative projects for WC students engaging the student body and the surrounding community. I think you're supposed to turn that off. Hi, I'm Kristen Beal. I'm the director of Shift Space Gallery. And I started in December of 2017. And I've really worked to create a leadership team and um, make Shift Space kind of an incubator for students to learn the ins and outs of gallery management <clears throat> and for um, student artists to be um, kind of trying new things in the gallery. Um, this fall we moved into our new space at Groover Labs which you should have a handout there that talks about that. Um, we're really excited about our new space. Um, we're able for the same price that we were paying on commerce to nearly double the space, um, we have um, hours, Monday through Friday from 8 to 4, the gallery is open. Um, we have event space there that is accessible to us. It's, and, and it's a you know, creative space overall. It's not at capacity yet. They're just um, opening, but I think it's just going to get better and better there. Hi, I'm Lydia Humphreys. Um, I'm a graduate, and I'm part of one of the members of Shift Space. <clears throat> Hi, guys. I'm Amy Hoosier. I recognize some of you guys from SGA last year. Um, I am a member of the Shift Space student group and the graduate advisor. So. And I'm Jeff Plasky. I'm the director of the School of Art, Design, and Creative Industries. All right. And if you just want to jump right into um, presenting whatever you prepared to present. OK, I wasn't sure exactly what the format was here. So uh -huh. what would you like us to present? You well, want to go if over If you want to just, just generally what happens is you'll just describe a little bit about what Shift Space does and then describe uh, your budget and what goes into that and then if you're um, I see that you're asking for a small increase due to um, your like statewide benefit increase so if you just you can talk about that as well sure I mean the increase I believe is just the as you said the statewide benefit increase we have a bit of surplus um, because we moved out of the previous space well actually there was still surplus from the when the director before me left. And then when we moved out of the previous space, um, you know, we didn't have to pay rent for a few months, so I kind of let that accumulate there. But in this new space, I'm going to have more students working, and so I've l I'm not asking for more funds this year because I anticipate potentially needing about $10,000 more the following year. But of course, I we have to... <laughs> go through this year and see what really happens. But um, I don't think, I, I'm not going to need any this year. We have enough in surplus for that. Um, as I said, you know, one of the things that we do is just the general programming at Shift Space at Groover Labs and prior to that on Commerce Street. But I've also really been trying to engage the um, campus community through Shift Space. I recognize that there are students that live here on campus that may never have an opportunity to go out for first or final Friday, <laughs> whichever um, we're doing. And so we partnered with um, Shocker Hall and the Flats and did some workshops there. We did the creative crosswalk, um, chalk, temporary crosswalks in front of the Ulrich. I'm um, always looking for kind of strategic partnerships that allow us to kind of get in front of audiences that we wouldn't normally be in front of. And we continue to do that um, now. So 
now we're you know we're in our maybe fourth show at the new space is that right yep four <clears throat> um and so we're kind of catching a stride and um you know some growing pains just trying to figure out protocols in this new space with new um landlords and you know new everything um but i think it's going really well our numbers are um stable are there if you're at any way tuned in to the first Friday versus final Friday <laughs> drama that's playing out across the city. Um, it doesn't really seem to be affecting us at all, I think. And I felt this when we moved off of Commerce Street, that Shift Space has an audience that is going to follow us wherever we go. And that has proven true so far. So, um, yeah. Something. Uh, so one of the great things about Shift Space from a student perspective um, is it's given me this uh, platform and opportunity to learn about um, a different side of the profession in the arts, so gallery work and gallery administration. Previously, I hadn't considered that as a career path um, or working in that field at all, really. Um, so it's given me opportunities to be a curator of exhibitions in this gallery space that I've worked at how to install exhibitions and um, really like advertise for a gallery. Um, and it's taught me a lot outside of the classroom, been a really great tool for me. Um, and part of our programming, excuse me, programming that we do um, for other students right now, um, I'm in the middle of uh, scheduling and developing a lecture series for current WSU students um, taking place in March and April, where they will be invited to come to Groover Labs and give a uh, like 15 minute lecture about their work or about their research and projects they've been completing at WSU, which really shares the um, I think WSU experience with other shockers from different schools that don't necessarily get to have that interaction with each other very frequently. I think that's an important note that I want to stress is that at Shift Space, we're really, I mean, any, and I tell these guys this all the time, we're going to touch um, current art and design students. They have to come to Shift Space at some point. So we're not really trying to recruit ADSI students. We're out there trying to get students from across the campus. Um, and Carter's lecture series is one way. He's done a kind of campus-wide call, and he has students that are going to be involved in this that are not current art students. I mean, of course, we're an incubator for current, current art students. That is going to happen. They are going to find us, right? And we want them to. But um, I'm also I'm, I'm involved in a nonprofit in town called Harvester Arts, and it's I'm really passionate about bringing art to people. I mean, the point of art is enrichment; it enriches our lives. That's why it's a required course in a liberal arts education. It's about enrichment. So we're always looking for ways that we can touch the lives of the community, basically through art. Hey, I think we'll open it up to questions if that's if that's okay with you um so i'm gonna give the first question to what representative representative moika hi i'm ann moika a large representative um since you're not asking for funding until um 2022 what other um funding options are you are you looking at or currently have i'll say well, we're not asking for additional funding. <laughs> we are asking for funding. Um, <laughs> but, um, some things that we've been considering are, right now we do not charge um, a percentage of first sold work in the gallery. Traditionally, we haven't. But there have been a few occurrences in the last year where we're like, wait a minute, <laughs> this doesn't make sense. We should... Um, take a percentage of this so the student team is kind of we're working through that to figure out what that would look like um, that won't generate a huge revenue stream but I think it's just best practice when students um, go out into the world and work as artists that they are going to have to pay a percentage when they sell their work in a gallery I think we can be um, more accommodating than most gallery spaces would be to them but I, it, it is a 
practice that will happen. And I think it's good for my team to understand how that happens as well as a student that is, or community member that is selling work in the gallery. Um, another um, way is a poster project that I, I'm gonna let Lydia speak about that. Um, okay, so uh, we have plans to um, start a, a, pro a monthly poster project um, that would include um, students from all over the campus to be able to um, input designs um, that we would sell monthly um, on first Fridays. Are there first Fridays? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that would that would be something that would create like a very s a smaller revenue. Um, but would be beneficial to bringing in um, more community members and having something that's like collectible for the community as well. Any further questions? Representative Kirk. Hi, my name is John. I'm the representation of the College of Fine Arts. And um, I know that there are a lot of people within McKnight and everything that have to, like it's part of their requirements is to display their art, their photos that are taken and everything like that. Um, <clears throat> my question is how easily, um, like how easy is it to get the knowledge out that it is open for anyone to do that? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm learning as I go. I had somebody in this last show that um, was open to all, all the, anytime we do a call for entry, it's open to the campus body. Um, and this was the Sandbox Soup Show, and this um, student, who is actually an art and design student, um, you know, wrote us this really lovely thank you card for including her in the show. And I was like, that's great, but this is your gallery, right? So we're getting ready to start a campaign that just really makes that clear. We've rebranded in the last year, and um, we want students campus-wide to understand that th this is theirs you, you know there's no you don't have to be in the shift space student group to show in the shift space gallery and so I think that is going to be a um, like a re-education like as students come through um, the university and graduate and and leave we have to just continue kind of pressing the gas about that but um, and we're also looking at scheduling we have a weekly um, kind of staff meeting and we're looking at scheduling multiple um, kind of recruiting um, shift space student group meetings um, some at Groover Lab some here um, just to start to spread that word and let people know that that they can be involved and then once you're a part of the shift space student group um, there are several months that are open for programming, right? So the student group decides what goes, what what the show is in that in the gallery that month. So, yeah. What are your hours of operation? Um, Monday through Friday from eight to four, okay. and by appointment. <clears throat> and have you done any? Um research into how much foot traffic you get at a certain point in time or on certain days? I mean, right now, um, there's very little foot traffic. Uh, okay. We haven't been there for long. We yeah. moved in in October. That's, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> right. Um, but I think as the capacity of Groover Labs um, grows, that will grow too. I mean, I, I'm guessing there's probably, uh, you know, 10 to 20 people a day right now, I think. Um, on first Friday events, I would say it's more in the 300 range. Okay. And I'll say about commerce, we had huge numbers at commerce for a long time. Um, those numbers really dropped off as more options became available across town on Final Friday. But a lot of the numbers on commerce were not actually engaging um, in the show. I would call them cookie grabbers, right? Like they would come through, because the gallery was so tiny, it was really hard to get in there. So they would come through and like through the lobby, clean up the <laughs> the treats and and go. And often the people that were really um, engaged in and wanted to see the show, they would reach back out and we would let them back in. But that's been a problem throughout the Commerce Arts District. Any other questions? We have time for one more. Uh, Representative Naramora. Hi. Um, 
I, I was wondering, um, with emerging concerns over the amount of off-site locations that Wichita State has um, by, um, by the administration, in, including the new president, will this affect um, the shift space presence off campus, do you think? Um, I don't think so. I mean, one of the reason to be off-site is to be a part of the arts community in this city, right? Um, that gives any student that works with the gallery or shows in the gallery, you know, kind of firsthand experience in the local art scene, which we're never going to replicate on campus. It, it, that, that, that won't happen on campus. So I don't think so. I've had a conversation with um, President Golden about it, and he didn't seem um, concerned about shift space. <laughs> so, Yeah. <laughs> I would, I would say one more thing about that, that, um, you know, the difference with um, Gruber Labs is that it's not a teaching, it's not a teaching space, it's not a place where we have a program um, as far as an academic program. So it's engaging uh, the innovation idea. I mean, I think it's, it's hitting on a lot of things that I think President Bardo was certainly interested in, I think President Golden is also still interested in. So I think that idea of creatives and engineers and the mixing of the two, I think that makes Gruber Labs a perfect um, spot. So I think that um, what President Golden is really concerned more about is the academic programs moving to other locations, I think. That's my impression. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's really an issue for this. Thank you. Do we want to jump into the visiting artist lecture series? Yes. Okay, awesome. Let's. Um, well, I don't have a printout for that one, but essentially Clayton Staples Gallery Visiting Artist Lecture Series um, <clears throat> is, a, is a gallery that we bring professional artists, um, regional and national artists in, and they then work directly with our students. Um, Amy and Lydia are two students that, are, that work for Clayton Staples as part of their GTA. So again, we're creating these kind of um, applied learning opportunities or just real work opportunities, I would rather say. Like the, this, uh, this is real um, resume material that will give them the work experience to be able to go out and, and get gallery management jobs. Um, we bring four artists a year. Um, we're trying to streamline the process that, um, from each area of ADSI uh, faculty present artists that they think should come, and then there's a, a galleries group that votes on that. Students are involved in that process now as well. And <clears throat> um, the artist gives a lecture, and they do studio visits or workshops, um, and become a real kind of, uh, oftentimes, a mentor and resource um, for our students. So I don't know. Jeff, you want to say anything? Um, one other thing about those uh, artists is, as with all lectures across campus that academic departments um, host and put on, those those are available to all students. Um, we try and get the posters up around campus to try and draw people in. May or may not be uh, most people's interest, but um, we've had some very interesting um, people come through, international artists, one from um, a, a Cuban who lives in um, Canada, which was very interesting installation. Um, another Cuban artist who came uh, and did s um, an ex uh, exhibition, I think it was actually partly with Clayton Staples and partly with Shift Space, that talked a lot about um, freedom of uh, information in Cuba with the internet, and things like that. So I think, you know, these are programs that are um, of interest, should be of interest to all of our students. Um, the next show that we have going in is actually a collaboration with um, the LAS biology area through the Watkins Lecture Series. It's a, I believe he's a microbiologist who also paints, and so he paints um, watercolors of germs that are greatly enlarged and all of those. And so it's, it's really kind of an interesting, um, I think it's going to be an interesting show. He's also going to do a workshop. Um, and so we're, we are looking for ways to try and engage more students, obviously. We'd love, we'd love for all the students to come through and uh, take a look at the work, uh, because it's a great opportunity for you all to see what people around the world are doing. So, 
Um, so we'll open it up to questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions about the Risley Artist Lecture Series? Sorry, Two, yes. Representative Berth. <coughs> uh, sorry. So I do have one. Uh, so looking at the budget itself, it looks like uh, from last year, the $50 got merged into contractual services. Is that due to like the location change or what's it? For Clayton I, Staples? Hmm? Clayton Staples, I don't know. I don't have that information in front of me. Contractual services? Yeah, so uh, she's gonna run you over the copy I'm looking <laughs> okay. at. <laughs> um. I'm sorry, Michael. So where are you talking? The oh, fifty dollars for right. So looking at 2020s adopted, uh, and then 2021s requested. It, you know, there's no increase, but it just looks like money had moved, and I was curious why it had moved. Well, it's moved to commodities, and I, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at the budget to see why. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is. Mm -mm. I don't but know. I can sure check. Yeah, we can find out. I would yeah. appreciate it. Thank yeah. You. yeah, I'm not sure what that is. The The budget, um, I think, was cut, what, $1,500 or so uh, two years ago. And, um, you know, with visiting artists that come in, there's shipping of materials, there's travel expenses, they're performing tasks and things here. In the past, we tried to give them an honorarium of $1,000 to cover all of their expenses. Um, and then the school tried to supplement those things. When, with the cut back in uh, funding, we've you know had to uh, put more money towards that, which we're very willing to do. I think um, as we have budget, we just so happened to have a donor that gave some money that we could um, help fund those artists that are coming in at a little better rate um, to make it a little bit more worth their time. And the, if we can offer them a little bit more, we bring a different caliber of group of, of people in. So. Um, so, yeah, I think, I, I, I'm sorry I can't speak to the $50 and the con, uh, commodities issue, but I'll look into it and find out what that is. So. so just a point of clarification on that. Within the budgeting system, there's thousands of accounts, and there are just some that are categorized as commodities and some as contractuals, and it's probably just the line that things happen to be entered on for that. There's lots of different lines. So. It could have and, been. And they change, too, for different. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, like, you'll enter something in, and it'll be this line item, and then they'll put it as something else the next time you enter it in. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and that, that could also be um, money that we spent towards. So every time, think of this in your home, every time an artist comes in, they put a whole bunch of holes in the wall, and then every time they leave, they leave those holes behind. Um, so we have to buy paint. We have to, I mean, the gallery gets painted every time a new artist comes in. All the holes mm -hmm. get patched. It may be that in the past the school has provided the um, patch and the paint, and this time for some reason we uh, pulled money out of Clayton Staples because it was for Clayton Staples. But I, I would assume with the commodities and that small amount that that's probably what it is, was that we had to buy paint to repaint the gallery. Mm. So, But I will check. Does anyone have any more questions about the Visiting Artists Lecture Series? Uh, we have five minutes, so if anyone had a further question about shift space galleries, we can ask that as well. Anyone? We just checked their budget. They had $50 budgeted in stationery and oh. like printing supply it. stuff. So, okay. yep. Cool. Great. So, yeah. awesome. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So, yes, and it's we've printing. started to uh, um, pay for those through the school, too. So, yeah, I think there was, there was something that we had to have printed. Um, I can't remember what that was, but <laughs> sorry. I don't remember. Too many things. <laughs> right. um, so I did have one question about the shift space gallery. Um, so in some in the budget that we sent out, we had a that we had two questions, and I this has happened with several groups, so I think it must have just been a mix up. Um, we had several two questions about. If you have a funding increase, um, oh, sorry, no, sorry, second question. If you have reserves, um, could you state your res current reserve balance? And then um, 
justify the need for those reserves. Uh, could you send that to me if you do have any reserves? Uh, just s I'll send the question out to you so that you have it, but just so that we have the answer to that question. And then there was one other um, about like external revenue. So if you have any external revenue, it, if you could answer that question, I'll send it out to you as well. Okay. Does that sound good? Yes. Okay. We can do that. Awesome. And then we're trying to get all those compiled back by Wednesday so that we can have them okay. for deliberations. I know. By so tomorrow? By tomorrow. But it can be tomorrow evening or, okay. like, or even <laughs> even, like, <laughs> even if you can get it to me by Thursday morning. Okay. Like before if you, one, you're going to send me an email, I, I'll, I'll send you, I'll send you it the email of the two questions. Take care of it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> okay. And even a rough estimate is yeah, just your best work. So. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Well, one thing I just wanted to say is we really appreciate you guys' support over the years, and um, I'm really excited about this move to Gruber Labs because I think it it really, I think, utilizes the money in a much better way. And if you haven't been down, I would strongly encourage you to come down to Gruber Labs. Uh, first first Friday is a great time to do that. What's the show that's opening this first um, Friday? This first Friday, this is coming first Friday, is the BFA um, exhibition, senior exhibition. And the following month will be Amy Huger's thesis exhibition. Um, so, yeah, come see us. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, um, and we'll, we'll keep you informed about what we're doing. All right. Well, thank you for coming in, hey, and thank you for... Sorry, I've been whispering yeah. over here. Yeah. I just, because of the question, I think, and the timing of it, if you look at what this says, they had 14,000. I don't know why they're printing. You have little eyes than I do. 14000 and how much? 540. So that was their reserve at the end of last fiscal year. And Kristen has already spoken about using that money to pay for extra students for the fall. So what additional information do you want from them beyond what, what we already have? Or do you just want it in writing? I mean, we can just have it. It's okay. It's not okay. 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 <laughs> Let me know if and you the, need the, something. I'll send it. Okay. And the second question. Okay. The additional revenue was the other question. Okay. If you have additional revenue that isn't listed, then just answering that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We'll get that sent over to okay. you. Okay. Thanks. All right. All right. Thank well, you. thank you for coming in, and thanks. thank you for all the work that you do for our students and for the arts. Thank you. So Gabe is passing out our PowerPoint presentation for this year. Um, our, last year we had like 
technical difficulties trying to get our presentation set up and it ate up a lot of our time. Um, so I decided to print it off for everyone and I'm like 98% sure I have enough copies. Um, so, and also because print still matters, so. So we have the sunflower with us. Where I'm going to let them introduce themselves and then um, tell us a little bit about their request, and then we'll open it up for questions like usual. So just brief introductions. Thank you. Um, my name is Kylie Cameron. I'm the editor-in-chief of the sunflower. Uh, my name is Madeline Diebler. I'm the advertising manager for the sunflower. Hi, my name is Teresa Moore, and I work in the Office of Financial Operation, and I'm the financial advisor for the Sunflower. And I am not Amy DeVault. Uh, she, Amy DeVault's the faculty advisor. I'm Jeff Jarman, here substituting for Amy. Awesome. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, has everybody here, like, picked up a paper um, from the Sunflower before, like, looked at one of our articles online? Cool. So you guys kind of have a basic, like, understanding of what we do. Um, really, we're just a timely resource of information, especially um, for Wichita State University's campus. Um, we report on news, issues, activities. Um, we offer ourselves as kind of a forum of discussion um, and communication um, for, you know, really anyone um, at Wichita State. Um, we also provide, you know, a hands-on, um, effective uh, applied learning experience for students um, who just kind of want to get, you know, published work or who want to work in journalism. Um, we're also editorially independent, uh, which I think is probably the most important um, part of our publication. Um, everything that we do is run by students. Um, the only, I guess, like quote unquote adult we have on staff is our faculty advisor. Um, but she does not have any prior review of what we write or publish in our paper um, or publish online. Um, so like I said, we're applied learning experience and we've been on this campus since 1896. So basically the founding of this university um, and we employ about 35 to 40 students a year um, and we encourage civic, en civic engagement among all students, faculty, staff on this campus. Um, so far in the past six months, we've had almost uh, 280,000 plus um, page views alone on our website. Um, and then since our relaunch, uh, we got a totally new website in 2016, um, which <laughs> this website is a big improvement from our previous one. Um, but since that relaunch in October of 2016, we've had 3 million um, page views. Um, we also have almost 6,000 followers on Facebook. Um, and then obviously for print, we have 5,000 papers distributed twice a week. Um, so to kind of give you an example of things that we cover here on our campus, um, I think the two like biggest stories that we have had um, related to WSU this year has been the passing of President Bardot, um, but all and you know commemorative coverage of that, um, but also the presidential search and the announcement of President Jay Golden as our president. Um, you know, obviously other outlets do cover this, but not as extensively as we do. Um, you know, the Wichita Eagle no longer has a reporter dedicated to education and especially, you know, Wichita State. Um, so that's something that I really want to emphasize because, you know, we really are kind of, I would say the, I wouldn't say the only outlet dedicated to education here in Wichita, but, or Wichita State, but, you know, we're here. Um, we also have been doing pretty extensive coverage lately of Title IX. Um, which has been a really important issue. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen, you know, a lot of our coverage about that. And, you know, it doesn't just cover students. It also covers faculty and staff and visitors on this campus. Um, so that's really important. Um, we also do parking. Um, uh, but we also do, like, lighter things, so, like, features about students and faculty um, and sports as well. Sports gets a huge reach um, on our website. Um, but anyways, so moving on to our recent recognition. Um, this is the second year in a row that we've got third place best of show um, for our print publication at the um, Collegiate Media Association Conference um, this past fall, um, which is a huge deal because we're competing against schools that have like huge journalism programs. 
Um, you know, so it's pretty significant that we're able to, you know, place in the top three um, when we're competing against, you know, uh, just huge publications that actually have journalism departments um, and, you know, 50,000 plus students um, on their campus. Um, this is also the second year in a row that we've been a pacemaker finalist um, and also the only time in our history that we've been pacemaker finalists, um, which is like the top, um, I would say like one of the top honors um, of collegiate media. Um, we were pacemaker finalists for both online um, and our paper, um, which is the only time that's ever happened uh, last year. Uh, we've also, in the past five years, have had four of the Kansas Collegiate Journalists of the Year um, for Kansas, um, which is a pretty huge deal. Um, and we also, last year, um, won the All Kansas Award. Um, so we bid out, you know, K-State, KU, um, and other collegiate papers um, to win the top award for Kansas Media. Okay, uh, so just to introduce uh, the Sunflower ad sales and just to talk a little bit about advertising. So like a lot of the student positions on staff, the advertising manager is uh, it's an added learning opportunity for students. Uh, but just like um, any newspaper, professional, or college otherwise, uh, ad revenue has steadily dropped over the past decade. It's just a sign of the times. Um, the most significant losses for the Sunflower have been national ads or campus departments and organizations typically is what we've found. Um, but to, to talk a little bit more about the 2019-2020 advertising goal and how it's been going, um, we're on target to exceed our minimum $40,000 goal. So far, we've sold $38,000 um, so far. Uh, but success for this year's has been due to packaging, print, online, and social media all together for customers. So we've been selling like big advertising um, deals uh, with all three of those combined. Uh, and it was all about just how we went about it. Uh, we just completely like redesigned the media kit and just rethought our whole entire advertising and have just been pushing um, a lot more like digital <laughs> along with our print. So. Um, so our next uh, part is obviously our budget, which we are here for, um, which is what we are here for. Um, this is the approved uh, budget for next year. Um, obviously, we're asking for 145000 in student fees, uh, which is what we got last year. Um, it's what we feel pretty comfortable with. Um, we're kind of in that sweet spot. Um, this budget was also approved by the Publication Board, um, which is made up of area professionals, um, uh, Elliott School members, um, faculty, students, um, you know, Michael's also on it, Walter's on the Publication Board. Um, you know, so it's not just us who's deciding our budget. Um, it is, you know, a bunch of other people. Um, Teresa also sits on the Publication Board. Um, this budget has been gone through, like, fine combed like everything for I would say like five years now um, and we've really really cut down on expenses um, as you know advertising revenue has declined as student fees have declined um, or gone up you know we've really you know we find areas that you know I guess in like politics you call it pork um, and we've just cut that out and so you know 145,000 um, is what we have felt comfortable with we're not asking for an increase um, from last year. Um, this is exactly what we got last year. Um, and we also have budgeted um, $50,000 um, for ads. Um, Maddie has done an amazing job, um, a better job than I did last year as advertising manager, um, you know, selling ads. And so we think that forty dollars to $50,000 range is, you know, the most comfortable spot and it's redeemable. Um, so then moving on, um, basically, you know, like I said previously, our spending history, you know, we really do watch our spending when things are being cut, um, especially when advertising revenue um, was cut. Obviously, so, you know, you can look at the numbers um, in the fiscal year of 2007, um, we spent almost $300,000 um, in expenses, but obviously because, you know, advertising revenue declined, just like any other newspaper is dealing with, um, you know, we cut down significantly, and now we're at less than 200000 for uh, expenditures. Um, so th this is probably the most important part, 
and probably the one that I would em like to emphasize the most is that, you know, with as much as we are asking for in student fees, if you break that down um, with every student fee paying st student, obviously, um, that's six to seven dollars per student. Um, not to be that person, but that's like a latte at Starbucks, right? Um, and so really, you know, this is pretty cheap um, for the services that we offer, especially because we don't, you know, charge people um, for our coverage. Um, and it's, you know, it's just around the clock coverage, you know, for sports, for arts, for news, for anything kind of Wichita State related um, and Wichita State community related. Um, again, I would like to emphasize that, you know, like Maddie said, advertising is no longer a viable revenue stream um, for newspapers to, you know, cover everything. Um, you know, it's a nice supplement, but, you know, it, it's just not viable to cover everything at all. Um, every um, publication has dealt with this. Um, and I would just like to emphasize that student fees for us is basically like subscription costs. Um, so, you know, just like, I don't want to keep using the Washington Post, but really like the Washington Post, like their financial model, most of what covers them is their subscription costs. And that's what student fees is like for us. And so for six to $7 per fee paying student, I don't think is too much to ask. Um, again, uh, if you have any questions that are not able to be asked during this time, um, you can always email myself, um, Maddie, or our advisor. Um, she's not here today, she's out of town. Um, but yeah, I'd like to open this up for questions. So we'll open it up to questions. Also, I want to thank Kylie for coming in. I know Teresa couldn't make it, and generally she would help present the budget. So yeah, so thank you. Um, anyone, any questions? Our, oh, um, Representative Zacharias. So um, the Sunflower has the unique ability to reach all of our students. We have students who are out of state who are taking classes online. Um, since you're saying this is like a subscription cost for each of those students, how do you plan to reach those students? Um, so we've really put a focus on trying to increase our coverage this year, especially the diversity of our staff. Um, and increasing the diversity of our staff has been able to, it's helped us been able to reach other communities that we have not otherwise been able to reach before. Um, but really like our social media is what really has, um, yeah, in our newsletter has been, you know, our most, uh, a way that people have reached us the most. Um, we've really put an emphasis on that. Um, we've revamped like our Instagram account um, and we've gotten uh, quite a bit more followers this year. I haven't checked on that um, exactly like the increase from last year to now. Um, but you know, social media has definitely been a great tool for that. Um, and I would say our website has been a pretty big driver of traffic. Representative Kirk. Hi, my name is John. I'm representation for College of Fine Arts. Um, so, piggybacking off of what um, uh, representation, represent, re, yep, Zacharias. Um, <laughs> so, I understand that you have that you have social media and everything. But like for me, I'm a type of person that I like a face-to-face -face co uh, conversation. Do you have? Um, uh, opportunities, plans that like that are off this campus that you go and table somewhere, or you go and bring the information to someone that um, may not be able to come here. And I'm not saying go to their house, but do you have opportunities like that for our online students? Um, so our only off-campus pickup locations for the paper right now um, is Fairmount Coffee and Kirby's Beer Store um, right across the street. Um, we don't really have any other pickup locations off campus, but I mean, for our online students, you know, obviously social media still works, website. Um, we're, this is actually really exciting. So the Sunflower right now, and this is like super early stages, but 
we're part of a collaborative like journalism group here in Wichita. Um, so we're partnering with the Wichita Eagle, KSN, KMUW, um, a bunch of other media outlets um, to cover a very s- specific topic right now. Um, those plans are, you know, to be determined. Um, but that's obviously going to give us even more of a reach, and that's an awesome opportunity that we're able to be a part of and another way for us to be able to reach um, people like online students who otherwise, you know, may not have heard of us. So, Representative Kirk. Um, kind of to um, going into that um, as well. Um, you say that like social media is a big thing. My main reason of asking my previous question was um, how can you get um, previous uh, like alumni um, people that graduated years ago that um, still follow what we do but may not do social media or think it's just not for them how can you like how can you get to them so they can still understand what's going on and that they can see like oh I don't agree with this or hey I want to be a part of this um, that's a good question. Um, we also, and I keep forgetting about this, we have a newsletter um, that I actually started up last year, so I shouldn't be the one to forget about this. Um, but that's, I've noticed when people were subscribing to our newsletter last year and this year, um, that most of those people were actually alumni um, and people who were involved in the WCU community and older, um, I guess, folks um, within the community um, who probably, you know, uh, that newsletter is sent out through the email um, so, you know, they, I would say, tend to utilize email more than social media. Um, obviously, our website, again, is a big driver of traffic as well. Do you foresee, oh, sorry, do you foresee the, um, your partnerships with, like, KMUW and, uh, the Wichita Eagle to increase, or could you do more of them after this opportunity is opened up? Do you know? Or? Um... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the plan so far right now, I believe, is the partnership is for like two to three years. Um, So and part of that is, um, you know, coming up with another um, model um, and being able to cover other topics in our community as well. Um, There's another kind of project like this in Philadelphia right now where they've done I can't remember exactly how many, but, you know, after they're done with one topic, they move on to another one. So I think right now the topic that they're covering is housing, um, because housing is ridiculous and unaffordable in that community, especially for people of low income. Representative Zacharias. Um, Are there any plans to use the reserves, because you guys have, like, quite a bit of reserves, to expand or improve the sunflower? I cannot answer that question. You would have to contact Amy DeVault, our advisor. I'll send it to her. Representative Stephanopoulos. Hello, Themia Stephanopoulos, graduate student representative. Um, are you guys also administering the Sunflower Technology Fund? Is that also under your purview? Yeah, so we use that fund. Um, I believe that was in our... Um, paper that we sent over to you guys um, for a recommendation. Um, We use that to, um, yeah, we use that basically to revamp our computers and do kind of like a refresh and make sure that our software is up to date, um, that, you know, our Adobe products are also up to date as well. Um, My particular question is about the reserves that are listed here and the reserves that are listed in your primary funding request. So I would like the clarification, maybe you can send it to us. Um, so you list on the technology fund, you say you have a $12,000 roughly credit union uh, reserve, and then you have a $13,515 regular fund reserve. And then for the reserves for just your main funding request, you say it's about 150000 in a campus credit union account. Where does the regular fund fit into this? Is that a separate reserve account? Is there a separate campus reserve credit union account for technology? Can you tell me more about this? Or? Do you want to turn in? I'm on the um, form for the um, student service funding request on 1081-26. It kind of gives you a layout. Um, this fund is used for technical things like laptops, and that's the plan. 
is to buy new laptops at the end of uh, 2020 and 2021. Now, the amount that's in the um, the reserve fund at the campus credit union, I believe it's like 12000 and that is on the It's 12047 so that's the amount that's in the reserve account. So the, the cash balance that's here on campus in Banner uh, at WSU is 13515 So when they do the upgrade and, and they purchase the new laptops, they will be using the money that's here at WSU, and then they will supplement what's needed from the campus credit union to pick up the difference. Um, my question is about the number of accounts. Are there four accounts, or are there three accounts? Actually, we have Banner. We have WSU accounts. So we have two accounts here at Wichita State. So there's two cash accounts, and that's basically what they operate off of on a daily basis. That's their operating budget. So those are the, um, that you see the 13,515. That's the technology account. That is the cash in that account. And then in the other operating account, there's uh, the ending balance as of June 30th was 17,357,000. The other two accounts that you see that we have listed at the bottom, those are the accounts that's at the campus credit union. So there's two accounts at the campus credit union, one for technology and one for the other that was operating. Okay. And, and as of last year, they did draw down $40,000, which is also listed in the, the paperwork, um, to help supplement the shortcoming that they had. So just point of clarification, the campus um, credit union accounts are from advertising, right? That is correct. Okay, yeah. So the student fees money, just point of clarification, they, it, student fees money doesn't get transferred into accounts off campus. It would stay in the account and then um, be used or not used. So if there was like an unencumbered reserve balance, it would show up within our budgeting process. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any well, we have time for one more question, Representative Zacharias. So um, I just noticed at the bottom of page 161, there's the cash held in the campus credit union um, for the 10.81.25, and that's 149,000. Does that include the money for the technology as well, or is that a different account in itself? There's two accounts at the campus credit union. One account is the operating account that was from the advertising money, and the other one is for technology. And you can, that those accounts, when they are, it's a shortfall, they just move the, the money to cover the shortfall. And like I said, for the operating account this year, of fiscal year 19, we were short $40,000, so we moved $40,000 from the campus credit union account into the WSU operating account. All right, well, thank you so much for coming in, and thank you again for um, taking Teresa's place. All right, I think that's all that we have for today. So with that, we'll adjourn at 5.09. There you go.